Once upon a time, there lived a king and queen who had two handsome boys. So well fed and hardy were they that they grew like the day. Whenever the queen had a child, she sent for the fairies that she might learn from them what would be its future lot. After a while, she had a little daughter who was so beautiful that no one could see her without loving her. The fairies came as usual, and the queen, having feasted them, said to them as they were going away, Do not forget that good custom of yours, but tell me what will happen to Rosette, for this was the name of the little princess. The fairies answered her that they had left their divining books at home, and that they would come again to see her. Ah, said the queen, that bodes no good. I fear you do not wish to distress me by foretelling evil. But I pray you, let me know the worst and hide nothing from me. The fairies continued to make excuses, but the queen only became more anxious to know the truth. At last, the chief among them said to her, We fear, madame, that Rosette will be the cause of a great misfortune befalling her brothers, that they may even lose their lives on her account. This is all that we can tell you of the fate of this sweet little princess, and we are grieved to have nothing better to say about her. The fairies took their departure, and the queen was very sorrowful, so sorrowful that the king saw by her face that she was in trouble. He asked her what was the matter. She told him she had gone too near the fire and accidentally burned all the flax that was on her distaff. Is that all? replied the king. And he went up to his storeroom and brought her down more flax than she could spin in a hundred years. But the queen was still very sorrowful, and the king asked her what was the matter. She told him that she had been down to the river and had let one of her green satin slippers fall into the water. Is that all? replied the king. And he sent for all the shoemakers in the kingdom and made the queen a present of ten thousand green satin slippers. Still, the queen was no less sorrowful. The king asked her once more what was the matter. She told him that, being hungry, she had eaten hastily and had swallowed her wedding ring. The king knew that she was not speaking the truth, for he had himself put away the ring, and he replied, My dear wife, you are not speaking the truth. Here is your ring which I kept in my purse. The queen was put out of countenance at being caught telling a lie, for there is nothing in the world so ugly and she saw that the king was vexed. So she told him what the fairies had predicted about little Rosette, and begged him to tell her if he could think of any remedy. The king was greatly troubled, so much so that at last he said to the queen, I see no way of saving our two boys except by putting the little girl to death while she is still in her swaddling clothes but the queen cried that she would rather suffer death herself, that she would never consent to so cruel a deed, and that the king must try and think of some other remedy. The king and queen could think of nothing else, and while thus pondering over the matter, the queen was told that in a large wood near the town, there lived an old hermit who made his home in the trunk of a tree, whom people went from far and near to consult. It is to him I must go, said the queen. The fairies told me the evil, but they forgot to tell me the remedy. She started early in the morning, mounted on her little white mule that was shod with gold and accompanied by two of her maids of honor who each rode a pretty horse. When they were near the wood, 
they dismounted out of respect and made their way to the tree where the hermit lived. He did not much care for the visits of women, but when he saw that it was the queen approaching, he said, Welcome, what would you ask of me? She related to him what the fairies had said about Rosette and asked him to advise her what to do. He told her that the princess must be shut up in a tower and not be allowed to leave it as long as she lived. The queen thanked him and returned and told everything to the king. The king immediately gave orders for a large tower to be built as quickly as possible. In it he placed his daughter, but that she might not feel lonely and depressed, he and the queen and her two brothers went to see her every day. The elder of these was called the Big Prince, and the younger the Little Prince. They loved their sister passionately, for she was the most beautiful and graceful princess ever seen, and the least glance of hers was worth more than a hundred gold pieces. When she was fifteen years old, the big prince said to the king, Father, my sister is old enough to be married. Shall we not soon have a wedding? The little prince said the same to the queen, but their majesties laughed and changed the subject and made no answer about the marriage. Now it happened that the king and queen both fell very ill and died within a few days of one another. There was great mourning, everyone wore black, and all the bells were tolled. Rosette was inconsolable at the loss of her good mother. As soon as the funeral was over, the dukes and marquises of the kingdom placed the big prince on a throne made of gold and diamonds. He wore a splendid crown on his head and robes of violet velvet embroidered with suns and moons. Then the whole court cried out, Long live the king! And now on all sides there was nothing but rejoicing. Then the young king and his brother said to one another, Now that we are the masters, we will release our sister from the tower where she has been shut up for such a long and dreary time. They had only to pass through the garden to reach the tower, which stood in one corner of it, and had been built as high as was possible, for the late king and queen had intended her to remain there always. Rosette was embroidering a beautiful dress on a frame in front of her when she saw her brothers enter. She rose and taking the king's hand, said, Good day, sire. You are now king, and I am your humble subject. I pray you release me from this tower where I lead a melancholy life. And with this, she burst into tears. The king embraced her and begged her not to weep, for he was come, he said, to take her from the tower and to conduct her to a beautiful castle. The prince had his pockets full of sweet meats, which he gave Rosette. Come, he said, let us get away from this wretched place. The king will soon find you a husband. Do not be unhappy any longer. When Rosette saw the beautiful garden full of flowers and fruits and fountains, she was so overcome with astonishment that she stood speechless, for she had never seen anything of the kind before. She looked around her. She went first here, then there. She picked the fruits off the trees and gathered flowers from the beds, while her little dog, Fredelon, who was as green as a parrot, kept on running before her, saying yap, 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 and jumping and cutting a thousand capers, and everybody was amused at his ways. Presently, he ran into a little wood, whither the princess followed him, and here her wonder was even greater than before, 
when she saw a large peacock spreading out its tail. She thought it so beautiful, so very beautiful, that she could not take her eyes off of it. The king and the prince now joined her and asked her what delighted her so much. She pointed to the peacock and asked them what it was. They told her it was a bird, which was sometimes eaten. What? she cried. Dare to kill and eat a beautiful bird like that? I tell you that I will marry no one but the king of the peacocks, and when I am their queen, I shall not allow anybody to eat them. The astonishment of the king cannot be described. But, dear sister, said he, where would you have us go to find the king of the peacocks? Whither you please, sire, but him and him alone will I marry. Having come to this decision, she was now conducted by her brothers to their castle. The peacock had to be brought and put into her room, so fond was she of it. All the court ladies who had not before seen Rosette now hastened to greet her and pay their respects to her. Some brought preserves with them, some sugar, and others dresses of gold, beautiful ribbons, dolls, embroidered shoes, pearls, and diamonds. Everyone did their best to entertain her, and she was so well brought up, so courteous, kissing their hands, curtsying when anything beautiful was given to her, that there was not a lord or lady who did not leave her presence gratified and charmed. While she was thus occupied, the king and the prince were turning over in their minds how they should find the king of peacocks if there was such a person in the world to be found. They decided that they would have Rosette's portrait painted, and when completed, it was so lifelike that only speech was wanting. Then they said to her, Since you will marry no one but the king of the peacocks, we are going together to look for him, and will traverse the whole world to try and find him for you. If we find him, we shall be very glad. Meanwhile, take care of our kingdom until we return. Rosette thanked them for all the trouble they were taking. She promised to govern the kingdom well, and said that, during their absence, her only pleasure would be in looking at the peacock and making her little dog dance. They all three cried when they said goodbye to each other. So, the two princes started on their long journey, and they asked everyone whom they met, Do you know the king of the peacocks? But the reply was always the same, No, we do not. Each time they passed on and went further, and in this way they traveled so very, very far that no one had ever been so far before. They came to the kingdom of the beetles, and these were in such numbers and made such a loud buzzing that the king feared he should become deaf. He asked one of them, who appeared to him to have the most intelligence, whether he knew where the king of the peacocks was to be found. Sire, replied the beetle, his kingdom lies 30,000 leagues from here. You have chosen the longest way to reach it. And how do you know that? asked the king. Because, answered the beetle, we know you very well. For every year, we spend two or three months in your gardens. The king and his brother embraced the beetle, and they went off arm in arm to dine together, and the two strangers admired all the curiosities of that new country where the smallest leaf of a tree was worth a gold piece. After that, they continued their journey. On their arrival, they found all the trees laden with peacocks, and, indeed, there were peacocks everywhere, so that they could be heard talking and screaming two leagues off. 
the king said to his brother, If the king of the peacocks is a peacock himself, how can our sister marry him? It would be folly to consent to such a thing. And would it be a fine thing for us to have little peacocks for nephews? The prince was equally disturbed at the thought. It is an unhappy fancy she has taken into her head, he said. I cannot think what led her to imagine that there was such a person in the world as the king of the peacocks. When they entered the town, they saw that it was full of men and women, and that they all wore clothes made of peacock feathers, and that these were evidently considered fine things, for every place was covered with them. They met the king, who was driving in a beautiful little carriage of gold studded with diamonds and drawn by twelve peacocks at full gallop. The king of the peacocks was so handsome that the king and the prince were delighted. He had long, light, curly hair, fair complexion, and wore a crown of peacock feathers. Directly he saw them, he guessed, seeing that they wore a different costume to the people of the country, that they were strangers, and wishing to ascertain if this was so, he ordered his carriage to stop and sent for them. The king and the prince advanced, bowing low and said, Sire, we have come from afar to show you a portrait. They drew forth Rosette's portrait and showed it to him. After gazing at it a while, the king of the peacocks said, I can scarcely believe that there is so beautiful a maiden in the whole world. She is a thousand times more beautiful, said the king. You are jesting, replied the king of the peacocks. Sire, rejoiced the prince, here is my brother, who is a king like yourself. He is called king, and my name is prince. Our sister, of whom this is the portrait, is the Princess Rosette. We have come to ask if you will marry her. She is good and beautiful. It is well, said the king. I will gladly marry her. She shall want for nothing, and I shall love her greatly. But I require that she shall be as beautiful as her portrait, and if she is in the smallest degree less so, I shall make you pay for it with your lives. We consent willingly, said both Rosette's brothers. You consent, added the king. You will go to prison then, and remain there until the princess arrives. The princes made no difficulty about this, for they knew well that Rosette was more beautiful than her portrait. They were well looked after while in prison, and were well served with all they required, and the king often went to see them. He kept Rosette's portrait in his room and could scarcely rest day or night for looking at it. As the king and his brother could not go to her themselves, they wrote to Rosette, telling her to pack up as quickly as possible as the king of the peacocks was awaiting her. They did not tell her that they were prisoners for fear of causing her uneasiness. The princess scarcely knew how to contain herself with joy when she received this message. She told everybody that the king of the peacocks had been found and that he wanted to marry her. Bonfires were lit and guns fired and quantities of sweet meats and sugar were eaten during the three days before her departure. After having thus dispensed hospitality to her visitors, she presented her beautiful dolls to her best friends and handed over the government to the wisest elders of the town, begging them to look well after everything, to spend little, and to save up money for the king on his return. She also prayed them to take care of her peacock, for with her she only took her nurse and her foster sister, 
and her little green dog, Fredolin. They set out in a boat on the sea, carrying with them the bushel of golden crowns and sufficient clothes for two changes a day for ten years. They made merry on their voyage, laughing and singing, and the nurse kept asking the boatman if they were nearing the kingdom of the peacocks. For a long time, all he said was, No, no, not yet. Then, at last, when she asked again, Are we anywhere near it now? He answered, We shall soon be there. Once more she said, Are we anywhere near it now? And he said, Yes, we are now within reach of shore. On hearing this, the nurse went to the end of the boat and sitting down beside the boatman said to him, If you like, you can be rich for the remainder of your life. He replied, I should like nothing better. She continued, If you like, you can earn good money. That would suit me very well, he answered. Well, she went on, Then tonight, when the princess is asleep, you must help me throw her into the sea. After she is drowned, I will dress my daughter in her fine clothes, and we will take her to the king of the peacocks, who will only be too pleased to marry her. And as a reward to you, we will give you as many diamonds as you care to possess. The boatman was very much astonished at this proposal. He told the nurse that it was a pity to drown such a lovely princess, and that he felt compassion for her. But the nurse fetched a bottle of wine and made him drink so much that he had no longer any power to refuse. Night having come, the princess went to bed as usual, her little Fredolin lying at her feet, not even stirring one of his paws. Rosette slept soundly, but the wicked nurse kept awake and went presently to fetch the boatman. She took him into the princess's room and together they lifted her up, feather bed, mattress, sheets, coverlet and all, and threw them into the sea. The princess all the while so fast asleep that she never woke. Fortunately, Her bed was made of phoenix feathers, which are extremely rare and have the property of always floating on water so that she was carried along in her bed as in a boat. The water, however, began gradually first to wet her feather bed, then her mattress, and Rosette began to feel uncomfortable and turned from side to side, and then Fredolin woke up He had a capital nose, and when he smelt the soles and codfish so near, he started barking at them, and this awoke all the other fish who began swimming about. The bigger ones ran against the princess's bed, which, not being attached to anything, span round and round. Rosette could not make out what was happening. Is our boat having a dance on the water, she said? I'm not accustomed to feeling so uneasy as I am tonight. And all the while, Fredolin continued barking and going on as if he was out of his mind. The wicked nurse and the boatman heard from afar and said, Let us make haste to land, for they were now just opposite the town of the King of Peacocks. He had sent down a hundred chariots to the landing place, They were drawn by all kinds of rare animals, lions, bears, stags, wolves, horses, oxen, eagles, and peacocks, and the chariot which was intended for the princess was harnessed with six blue monkeys that could jump, dance on the tightrope, and do endless clever tricks. They had beautiful trappings of crimson velvet overlaid with plates of gold. Sixty young maids of honor were also in attendance, 
who had been chosen by the king for the amusement of the princess. They were dressed in all sorts of colors. The nurse had taken great pains to dress her daughter finely. She had put on Rosette's best robe and decked her all over from head to foot with the princess's diamonds. But with all this, she was still as ugly as an ape with greasy black hair, crooked eyes, and a hump on her back, and added to these deformities, she had a disagreeable and sulky temper and was always grumbling. When the people saw her get out of the boat, they were so taken aback by her appearance that they could not utter a sound. What is the meaning of this? she said. Are you all asleep? Be off and bring me something to eat. A nice set of beggars you are. I will have you all hanged. When they heard this, they murmured, What an unpleasant creature! And she is so wicked! A nice wife for our king? Meanwhile, she still behaved as if she were already mistress of all and everything, and for no reason at all, boxed their ears or gave a blow with her fist to everybody in turn. As her escort was a very large one, the procession moved slowly, and she sat up in her chariot like a queen. But all the peacocks, who had stationed themselves on the trees so as to salute her as she passed, and who had been prepared to shout, Long live the beautiful Queen Rosette, could only call out, Fie, fie, how unpleasant she is, as soon as they caught sight of her. She was so enraged at this that she called to her guards, Kill those rascally peacocks who are insulting me. But the peacocks quickly flew away and only laughed at her. The king had word brought him that the princess was approaching. Well, he said, have her brothers, I wonder, told me the truth? Is she more beautiful than her portrait? Sire, said those near him, there will be nothing to wish for if she is as beautiful. You are right, replied the king. I shall be well content with that. Come, let us go and see her, for he knew by the hubbub in the courtyard that she had arrived. He could not distinguish anything that was said except, Fie, fie, how unpleasant she is and he imagined that the people were calling out about some little dwarf or animal that she had brought with her, for it never entered his head that the words were applied to the princess herself. Rosette's portrait was carried uncovered at the top of a long pole, and the king walked after it in solemn state, with all his nobles and his peacocks, followed by ambassadors from various kingdoms. The king of the peacocks was very impatient to see his dear Rosette, but when he did see her, well, he very nearly died on the spot. He flew into a violent rage, he tore his clothes, he would not go near her, he felt quite afraid of her. What? he cried. Have those two villains I have in prison had the boldness and impudence to make a laughing stock of me and to propose my marrying such a fright as that? They shall both be killed. While this was going on, the king and his brother, who knew that his sister was expected, had put on their bravest apparel ready to receive her, but instead of seeing their prison door open and being set at liberty, a body of soldiers had come and made them go down into a dark cellar full of horrible reptiles and where the water was up to their necks. No one was ever more surprised or distressed than they were. Alas, they said to one another, this is indeed a melancholy marriage feast for us. What happened that we should be so ill-treated? They did not know what in the world to think except 
that they were to be killed, and they were very sorrowful about this. Three days passed, and no news reached them of any kind. At the end of that time, the king of the peacocks came and began calling out insulting things to them through a hole in the wall. You called yourselves king and prince, that I might fall into your trap and engage myself to marry your sister. But you are nothing better than two beggars who are not worth the water you drink. I am going to bring you before the judges, who will soon pass their verdict upon you. The rope to hang you with is already being made. King of the peacocks, replied the king angrily, do not act too rashly in this matter, or you may repent it. I am a king as well as you, and I have a fine kingdom and rich clothing and crowns to say nothing of good gold pieces. You must be joking to talk like this of hanging us. Have we stolen anything from you? When the king heard him speak so boldly, he did not know what to think, and he felt half inclined to let them and their sister go without putting them to death. But his chief advisor dissuaded him from this, telling him that if he did not revenge the insult that had been put upon him, all the world would make fun of him and look upon him as nothing better than a miserable little king. The king thereupon swore that he would never forgive them and ordered them to be brought to trial at once. This did not take long. The judges had only to look at the real Rosette's portrait and then at the princess who had arrived, and, without hesitation, they ordered the prisoners' heads to be cut off as a punishment for having lied to the king, since they had promised him a beautiful princess. They repaired with great ceremony to the prison to read the sentence to them, but the prisoners declared that they had not lied, that their sister was a princess, that there must be something under this which they did not understand and they asked for a respite of seven days, as before that time had expired, their innocence might have been established. The king of the peacocks, who had worked himself up to a high pitch of anger, could with great difficulty be induced to accord them this grace, but at last he consented. While these things were going on at the court, we must say something about poor Rosette. Both she and Fredelon were very much astonished when daylight came to find themselves in the middle of the sea without a boat and far from all help. She began to cry and cried so sorrowfully that even the fishes had compassion on her. She did not know what to do nor what would become of her. There is no doubt, she said, that the king of the peacocks ordered me to be thrown into the sea, having repented his promise of marrying me, and to get rid of me quietly, he has had me drowned. What a strange man, she continued, for I should have loved him so much. We should have been so happy together. And with that, she burst out crying afresh. She remained floating about on the sea for two days, wet to the skin and almost dead with cold. She was so benumbed by it that if it had not been for little Fredelon, who lay beside her and kept a little warmth in her, she could not have survived. She was famished with hunger and seeing the oysters in their shells, she took as many of these as she wanted and ate them. Fredolin did the same to keep himself alive, although he did not like such food. Rosette became still more alarmed when the night set in. Fredolin, she said, keep on barking to frighten away the souls for fear they should eat us. So Fredolin barked all night, and when the morning came, the princess was floating near the shore. Close to the sea at this spot, 
there lived a good old man. He was poor and did not care for the things of the world, and no one ever visited him in his little hut. He was very much surprised when he heard Fredelon barking, for no dogs ever came in that direction. He thought some travelers must have lost their way and went out with the kind intention of putting them on the right road again. All at once, he caught sight of the princess and Fredolin floating on the sea, and the princess, seeing him, stretched out her arms to him, crying out, Good man, save me, or I shall perish. I have been in the water like this for two days. When he heard her speak so sorrowfully, he had great pity on her, and went back into his hut, to fetch a long hook. He waded into the water up to his neck and once or twice narrowly escaped drowning. At last, however, he succeeded in dragging the bed onto the shore. Rosette and Fredolon were overjoyed to find themselves again on dry ground and were full of gratitude to the kind old man. Rosette wrapped herself in her coverlet and walked barefooted into the hut where the old man lit a little fire of dry straw and took one of his dead wife's best dresses out of a trunk with some stockings and shoes and gave them to the princess. Dressed in her peasant's attire, she looked as beautiful as the day and Fredolon capered round her and made her laugh. The old man guessed that Rosette was some great lady, for her bed was embroidered with gold and silver, and her mattress was of satin. He begged her to tell him her story, promising not to repeat what she told him if she so wished. So she related to him all that had befallen her, crying bitterly the while, for she still thought that it was the king of the peacocks who had ordered her to be drowned. What shall we do, my daughter, said the old man? You are a princess and accustomed to the best of everything, and I have but poor fare to offer, black bread and radishes, but if you will let me, I will go and tell the king of the peacocks that you are here. If he had once seen you, he would assuredly marry you. He is a wicked man, said Rosette, He would only put me to death, but if you can lend me a little basket, I will tie it round Fredolin's neck. The old man gave her a basket, which she fastened to Fredolin's neck, and then said, Go to the best kitchen in the town, and bring me back what you find in the saucepan. Fredolin ran off to town, and as there was no better kitchen than that of the king, he went in uncovered the saucepan, and cleverly carried off all that was in it. Then he returned to the hut. Rosette said to him, Go back and take whatever you can find of the best in the larder. Fredolin went back to the king's larder and took white bread, wine, and all sorts of fruits and sweetmeats. He was so laden that he could only just manage to carry the things home. When the king of the peacock's dinner hour arrived, there was nothing for him either in the saucepan or in the larder. His attendants looked confused at one another, and the king was in a terrible rage. It seems, then, that I am to have no dinner, but see that the spit is put before the fire and let me have some good roast meat this evening. The evening came, and the princess said to Fredolon, Go to the best kitchen in the town, and bring me a joint of good roast meat. Fredolon obeyed, and knowing no better kitchen than that of the king, he went softly in. And while the cook's backs were turned, took the meat, which was of the best kind, from the spit and carried it back in his basket to the princess. She sent him back without delay to the larder, 
and he carried off all the preserves and sweetmeats that had been prepared for the king. The king, having had no dinner, was very hungry and ordered supper to be served early, but no supper was forthcoming. Enraged beyond words, he was forced to go supperless to bed. The same thing happened the following day, both as to dinner and supper, so that the king for three days was without meat or drink, for every time he sat down to table, it was found that the meal that had been prepared had been stolen. His chief advisor, fearing for the life of the king, hid himself in the corner of the kitchen to watch. He kept his eyes on the saucepan that was boiling over the fire, and what was his surprise? To see enter a little green dog with one ear that uncovered the pot and put the meat in its basket. He followed it to see where it would go. He saw it leave the town, and still following, came to the old man's hut. Then he quickly went and told the king that it was to a poor peasant's home that the food was carried morning and evening. The king was greatly astonished and ordered more inquiries to be made. His chief advisor, anxious for favor, decided to go himself, taking with him a body of archers. They found the old man and Rosette at dinner, eating the meat that had been stolen from the king's kitchen, and they seized them and bound them with cords. They brought word to the king that the delinquents had been captured, and he replied, Tomorrow, the last day of reprieve for my two insolent prisoners will expire. They and these thieves shall die together. He then went into his court of justice. The old man threw himself on his knees before him and begged to be allowed to tell him everything. As he was speaking, the king looked towards the beautiful princess, and his heart was touched when he saw her crying. The old man said that she was the princess Rosette who had been thrown into the water in spite of his weak condition he was in from having starved for so long, he gave three bounds of joy, ran and embraced her, and untied her cords, declaring the while that he loved her with all his heart. They at once went to find the princes, who thought they were going to be put to death, and came forward in great dejection, hanging their heads, the nurse and her daughter were brought in at the same time. The brothers and sister recognized one another as soon as they were brought face to face, and Rosette threw herself on her brother's necks. The nurse and her daughter and the boatman begged on their knees for mercy, and the universal rejoicing and their own joy was so great that the king and the princess pardoned them and gave the good old man a handsome reward, and from that time he continued to live in the palace. Finally, the king of the peacocks did all in his power to atone for his conduct to the king and his brother, expressing the deepest regret at having treated them so badly. The nurse restored to Rosette all her beautiful clothes and the bushel of golden crowns, and the wedding festivities lasted a fortnight. Everyone was happy, down to Fredelon, who ate nothing but his favorite foods for the rest of his life. Long, long ago, in old Japan, there lived an old bamboo woodcutter and his lovely wife. They lived a quiet, peaceful life in a cozy cottage at the base of a large mountain. Even though they were happy and content, 
They had no children and grew sad and lonely in their old age. Every morning he went into the hills where the bamboo grew plentiful in tall green plumes reaching up high towards the blue sky. He would cut down the beautiful green shoots, splitting them lengthwise. Then he would carry the bamboo wood home and make various items that he and his wife would sell in the village and thus would gain their humble living. One morning as usual, he had gone out to his work and having found a nice clump of bamboos, had set to work to cut some of them down. Suddenly, the green grove of bamboos was flooded with a bright soft light, as if the full moon had risen over the spot. Looking round in astonishment, he saw that the brilliance was streaming from one bamboo. The old man, very curious, dropped his axe and went towards the light. As he came closer, he saw that this soft moonlight came from a hollow in one of the bamboo stems, and to his amazement, standing in the midst of the soft beams of light, stood a tiny maiden, only three inches in height, so radiant, sweet, and lovely. You are a gift, sent to be our child, said the old man with a wide smile. And taking the little maiden in his hand, he brought her home to his wife to love and nurture. The maiden was so tiny that the wife put her into a basket to protect her from harm. The bamboo woodcutter and his lovely wife were now very happy. With beaming joy, they gave all the love within their heart to the little child who had come to them in such a magical way. Not only did the bamboo woodcutter and his wife now have a child to love, but the little moon maiden had also brought them good fortune. The bamboo woodcutter often found gold in the notches of the bamboos when he hewed them down and cut them up. Sometimes he would also find precious stones, and day by day he became rich. He built himself a fine house and was no longer known as the poor bamboo woodcutter, but as a happy, wealthy man. Three months passed quickly away, and in that time the little bamboo child had become a full-grown girl. Her foster parents did up her hair and dressed her in beautiful kimonos. She was of such wondrous beauty and seemed as though she were made of light. The house radiated a soft shining so that even in the dark of night, the house was surrounded by an ethereal glow. Her presence seemed to offer comfort to those there. Whenever the old man or his wife felt sad, they had only to look upon her sweet radiance and their sorrow vanished and they became happy and peaceful again. Finally, the day came for the naming of their newfound child. So the old couple called in a celebrated name giver. He thought the moon maiden may have been a daughter of the moon god because she always emanated beams of soft bright light and decided to give her the name Princess Moonlight. For three days the festival continued with song and dance and music. All the friends and family of the old couple were present and everyone enjoyed the festivities and the naming of Princess Moonlight. Everyone who saw her declare that her loveliness was absolutely enchanting and they announced that she may be the most beautiful maiden across the land. Throughout the years, Princess Moonlight brought such happiness and comfort to both her parents. 
She was always eager to help her father with his hard work, and she would help her mother with the chores and tend the garden. She was always polite and kind-hearted with all of the villagers who over the years had become quite fond of the lovely maiden. The fame of the maiden's kind heart and beauty spread, and there were many suitors who desired to win her hand or at the very least, to lay their eyes upon her. Suitors from far and wide posted themselves outside the house and made little holes in the fence in the hope of catching a glimpse of Princess Moonlight as she went from one room to the other along the veranda. There they stayed, day and night, sacrificing even their sleep for a chance of seeing her. So great was their desire to see the princess, but she would have none of them, for she claimed that her heart only belonged to her beloved foster parents, whom she loved so dearly and promised only to love them and to be their daughter. At last, most of the men, seeing how hopeless their quest was, lost heart and hope of ever seeing the princess, and returned to their homes, all except one knight whose ardor and determination only grew greater with obstacles. He would go without food and would take snatches of whatever he could get his hands on so that he might always stand outside the dwelling. Here he stood in all weathers, in sunshine and in rain. Sometimes he wrote letters to the Princess Moonlight, but the letters failed to draw any reply. He would write poems telling her of the hopeless love which kept him from sleep, from food, from rest, and even from his own home. Still, no reply came from the lovely Moon Maiden. In this hopeless state, the winter passed. The snow and frost and the cold winds gradually gave place to the gentle warmth of spring. Then summer came, and still this faithful knight kept watch and waited. At long last, he called out to the old bamboo woodcutter and begged him to have mercy upon him and to show him the princess. But the old man answered that since he was not her real father, he could not insist on her obeying him against her wishes. On receiving this stern answer, he sadly returned to his home and began to ponder over the best means of winning Princess Moonlight's heart. He took his rosary in his hand and knelt before his household shrine and burned precious incense, praying to Buddha to give him his heart's desire. Several days had passed, and by and by, the night became so restless that he set out for the bamboo woodcutter's house once more. The old man, seeing the knight approach the house, came out to greet him. The knight implored the bamboo woodcutter to speak to the princess and to tell her of the greatness of his love and how long he had waited through the cold of winter and the heat of the summer, sleepless and roofless through all weathers, without food and without rest, in the ardent hope of winning her, and he was willing to consider this long vigil as pleasure if she would give him but one chance to lay his eyes upon her. The old man listened carefully to the tale of love, for he felt sorry for this faithful suitor and would have liked very much to see his lovely foster daughter marry him. So he went to Princess Moonlight and said reverently, although you have always seemed to me to be a heavenly being, I have loved and raised you as my own child. Will you refuse to do as I wish? Then Princess Moonlight replied 
that there was nothing she would not do for him, and even though he was her foster father, that she honored and loved him as her own father, and furthermore, she could not even remember the time before she came to earth. The old man listened with great joy as she spoke these words. Then he told her how anxious he was to see her safely and happily married before he died. I am an old man, over 70 years of age, and my end may come any time now. It is necessary and right that you should marry this fine suitor. But why must I do this? I have no wish to marry now, cried the princess in distress. I found you, answered the old man, many years ago, when you were a little maiden only three inches high in the midst of a great white light. The light streamed from the bamboo in which you were hid and led me to you, so I have always known that you are ethereal and much more than a mortal woman. While I'm alive, it is fine for you to remain as you are if you wish to do so. But someday I shall cease to be, and who will take care of you then? Therefore, I pray you marry this brave and honorable knight. Even though her father reassured her that the brave knight was honorable and worthy, Princess Moonlight was still uncertain and did not feel it was wise to see him. My dear sweet daughter, what kind of man will you consent to see? he asked. I do not call this man who has waited on you for months lighthearted. He has stood outside this house through winter and summer, often denying himself food and sleep so that he may win you. What more do you need to feel more certain? Princess Moonlight was deeply saddened to see her foster father so heavy-hearted and with eyes wide with worry because of her great love for her father and after some further reflection she at last gave her consent to grant the knight's request to see her. That same evening the handsome young knight arrived and began to play his flute and to sing songs he himself had composed, telling her of his great and tireless love. The bamboo woodcutter went to him to offer his sympathy for all that he had endured and to thank him for all the patience that he had shown in his desire to win his foster daughter. Then with a wide smile, he finally gave him the message that she had finally consented to grant his wish to see her. In the meantime, her foster mother did up her hair and helped her dress in the most beautiful kimono, and it was now time for Princess Moonlight to finally meet the honorable handsome knight. Standing gracefully in the doorway of the chamber, Surrounded by a heavenly glow of moonlight, she was at last ready to make her entrance into the room. Her soft glowing light beaming brightly, illuminating the handsome knight who was eagerly awaiting her presence. Never had he seen anyone so wonderfully beautiful, and he could not but look at her for she was more lovely than any human being, shimmering in her own soft radiance. And Princess Moonlight too was mesmerized by the presence of this handsome young man who had the kindest eyes she'd ever seen. Her soft light beaming towards him and illuminating his entire being revealed to her the pureness of his heart and all her previous misgivings were in that moment swept away. Sweetest moonlight, my soul salutes you. I bow before you, said the knight, and getting down on one knee, 
The handsome young man continued, Princess Moonlight, you are my one true love. Will you marry me? In that moment, Princess Moonlight fell deeply in love with her knight. Trembling, breathless, her face radiant with a smile so bright, taking small, delicate steps towards him, longing more than anything to accept his hand in marriage. Just then, his strong, large figure casting a shadow over her, she suddenly began to lose her form. The knight horrified to see his love slowly fading away right before his eyes, swiftly moved away from her so that she would resume her former shape, and thankfully she did. But in that moment, Princess Moonlight had a flash of memory. Years ago, she began in a soft voice, my mother, the Moon Lady, sent me to Earth to help soothe and comfort my foster parents, who were very sad and lonely in their old age. Because this happened so long ago, I had forgotten. Gazing earnestly into his eyes, she continued, My love, I am not meant to live here forever, and I cannot marry you. For some day, very soon, the Moon Lady will swiftly come to bear me back home. She then lowered her head, and as tears welled from deep inside, she began to weep bitterly torn between her commitment to her moon mother and her desire to live upon the earth as a daughter and a wife. Devastated and confused by the turn of events, the knight bade her goodbye and left the house with a heavy heart. Princess Moonlight was the love of his life, and he thought of her night and day he now spent his days writing poems, telling her of his love and devotion, and sent them to her. His love letters and poems drew replies from the lovely maiden with many verses of her own composing, filling his heart with great joy, knowing that she still loved him. Her foster parents noticed that night after night, Princess Moonlight would sit on her balcony and gaze for hours at the moon with the deepest sadness, ending always in a burst of tears. One night, the old man found her thus weeping as if her heart were broken, and he besought her to tell him the reason of her sorrow. With many tears, she told him that he had guessed rightly when he supposed her not to belong to this world, that she had in truth come from the moon, and that her moon mother, who had felt sorry for them, had granted them their wish for a child. Princess Moonlight had stayed with them until she was a maiden grown, and now that their wish had been fulfilled, the time had come for her to return back in the sky. Over the next several days, Princess Moonlight said her goodbyes to all the people she would be leaving behind once she returned back to the sky. Even the young handsome knight came to bid farewell, and as he sadly looked into her eyes, he said, My love for you is eternal, my sweet Moonlight. Your memory will be forever locked within my heart. Princess Moonlight and her earthly parents stood embraced in the garden and together they watched the full moon rise into the night sky. Swiftly, a shimmering silver bridge arched down from the moon all the way to the ground. They all stared in awe at the radiant moon lady as she walked gracefully down the bridge 
with her long silvery hair glistening in the moonlight. The moon lady slowly approached the young girl. She pulled her close by wrapping around her a glittery silver shawl. Then she embraced her lovingly and gently led her back to the night sky. Princess Moonlight was happy to return back home, yet she was sad to leave those she loved behind. But lo and behold, as she wept, the large silver droplets took wing, carrying the spirit of comfort and love to her beloved knight and to her earthly father and mother. And to this day, Princess Moonlight's silver tears are seen as fireflies flitting around the forests and wetlands of Japan, bringing love and comfort to the earth. Once upon a time, a wicked nobleman rose in rebellion against his rightful king and taking the royal forces by surprise, defeated them and seized the kingdom. The dethroned king who had been severely wounded in battle was cast in prison where he soon died. His widow, the queen, managed to escape from the palace before the usurper could apprehend her. The queen ran into the dark forest which lay behind the palace, holding her baby daughter in her arms. It was winter time, and a heavy snow had hidden the footpaths and the roads, making it very difficult for her to find her way. The queen was quickly losing hope because she knew that she was lost. Bravely, she trudged along through the silence and the cold her heart sinking as mile after mile revealed no sign of a house or a shelter. At long last, late in the afternoon, when the red shield of the sun could scarcely be seen through the wood branches of the trees, she noticed a dim light coming from a little grove of cedars by the shore of a frozen lake. The queen slowly made her way toward this light, and discovered a little thatched hut in the silent wood. She soon learned it was the house of one of the dwarfs of the forest. The dwarf took pity on the queen and took her in, offering her food, shelter and warmth, but his efforts proved futile. The poor woman, weak and exhausted, didn't even have the strength to tell the dwarf anything about herself or the child she carried, and sadly, by nightfall, she died. So the little dwarf, who was a good, kind old fellow, raised the little girl as if she were his own child. His brother, the dwarf of the mountain, made her the prettiest leather shoes, and his cousins, the dwarfs of the pines, made the little girl dresses and shawls from a red cloth woven on fairy looms. On the night her mother brought her to the hut, the little girl was wearing a golden heart-shaped locket with a crown and the letter M upon it in diamonds. So the dwarf called the little girl Marianna. Seventeen years passed, and Marianna grew into a lovely young woman. Her hair was as black as the raven's wing, her eyes were as blue as the midsummer sea, and her skin was as fair as the petal of a rose. One spring morning, a little yellow bird flew into the cedar grove and gave the dwarf a letter which it held in its beak. The dwarf read the letter and said to Marianna, The Emperor of the Elves has asked me to come to the great assembly of the dwarfs which is to be held next year on the Golden Mountain. Alas, what are we to do? I cannot take you with me, dear child, for it is forbidden to bring mortals to the assembly, nor can I leave you here in this lonely wood by yourself. To this, Marianna replied, Do not fear, dear father. 
Give me your crystal flask with the healing water, and I shall go forth into the world until it is time for you to return again. Perhaps I shall discover somebody who can tell me the meaning of this locket, or the history of my dear mother. Very well, replied the dwarf, and taking his knotted staff, he bid farewell to the young maiden, and made his way over the hill to the Golden Mountain. Then Mariana took the crystal flask of the healing water and walked boldly out of the wood into the wide, wide world. It was the middle of the spring. The ice and snow had all disappeared. The trees were putting forth their leaves, and there were clusters of primroses by the roadside. In the swaying, rustling heart of a great elm tree, a little thrush was singing. Through cities and towns went lovely Mariana, bringing good cheer to the helpless and the sick, and curing all who came to her, rich and poor, with the wonderful water of healing. But never did she find anybody who could tell her about the gold heart with the diamond crown. Now it came to pass that, as Mariana was one day walking through a village in the heart of the Adamant Mountains, a ragged old woman besought her with tears to come to a hamlet which stood at the head of a high and dangerous path. Touched by the old woman's supplication, Mariana followed her to the hamlet and found in a wretched hut, lying on a dismal bed, a beautiful young peasant girl dying of a fever. So Mariana touched the girl with the water of healing, and in an instant, she became well and strong. Dear lady, said the peasant girl, pressing Mariana's hands to her lips, how sweet and kind are you. Great is the debt I owe thee. And as the girl poured out her thanks, Mariana heard a faint chirp, and looking down, beheld a little yellow bird crouching on the hearthstone. Every now and then he hid his head under his wings and cried unhappily. It was the yellow bird which had brought the message from the Emperor of the Elves. Poor little bird, said Mariana, bending down and taking him up in her hands. Why are you crying so mournfully? Who has harmed you? But the bird uttered only a forlorn little cry and hid his head again under his wings. I found him on the rocks at the mountain top yesterday, said the mother. Someone has wounded him, his wing is broken. And she put the bird on the floor of the house and bade Mariana watch how he fluttered, trailing a wing in the dust. Again Mariana stooped, and picking up the bird, touched the wounded wing with the water of healing. Scarcely had she done so, when the yellow bird burst into a joyous and golden song, and flying to the window, beat madly against the panes. Then the peasant girl threw open the casement, and the yellow bird flew out into the streaming sun. He is gone forever, said the peasant girl. Nay, he returns, said Mariana gently as the yellow bird flew back and perched in the sheltering of Mariana's arms. Then, accompanied by the peasant girl and the yellow bird, who flew singing before her, Mariana went down the dangerous path to the high road in the valley. When they reached the foot of the path, the peasant girl cried, Farewell, dear Mariana. May it someday be mine to repay thee. Into the world again went Mariana, and with her went the yellow bird. Presently she came to the fairest land which she had ever seen, a land of rolling fields, little hills, and rivers bordered with pale willow trees. This pleasant land, unknown to Mariana, was part of her father's kingdom, and she was really its queen because her father had been the last rightful king. 
Now while Mariana had been in the forest, the wicked nobleman who had stolen the kingdom from Mariana's father had died, leaving his brother, Garabin, in charge of the kingdom and of the interests of the nobleman's little son, Prince Desire. This Garabin, however, taking advantage of the youth and helplessness of his nephew, had himself assumed the state and heirs of king. For some time he had enjoyed undisturbed the possession of his stolen throne, but as desire grew taller and stronger every year, Garabin began to fear the day when he would be compelled to resign in favor of his nephew. When the prince reached his twentieth year, Garabin would certainly have killed him openly had he dared, but fearing the people, he resolved to use secret methods and bribed a cruel magician to afflict poor desire with a deadly and mysterious malady. Of this malady, desire was slowly dying, for no medicine could cure him or even give him any relief from his constant pain. Every morning, the cruel Garabin, in the hope of finding his nephew dead, would go to the sick room, and you may be sure that his wicked heart rejoiced when he found the prince weaker and more feverish. Garabin had just returned from a visit to the prince, who was rapidly failing, when the captain of the castle guard came to him with the news that the wonderful Mariana had arrived in the kingdom. The king gave orders that she be brought before him. So Mariana, walking between two guards and followed across the courtyard by crowds of curious people, was led before the king. The little yellow bird sat on Mariana's shoulder and never did the maiden appear lovelier or more gentle. Scarcely had Garabin set eyes on Mariana when he caught sight of the golden locket which she wore about her neck. Had he not been very old and crafty, he would have darted from his golden throne, for he knew that the little golden heart set with diamonds had been one of the crown jewels and that therefore Mariana must be the missing princess and rightful queen of the kingdom. What was he to do? If he refused to let Mariana help the prince, the people may begin to suspect him and start a revolution which would thrust him from his throne. If he allowed Mariana to cure the prince, the prince would certainly demand the kingdom on his 21st birthday. What was he to do with Mariana, whose right to the throne was superior even to his nephew's? Perplexed and with fear in his heart, the king sought the cruel magician who had cast the spell on desire. The magician lived in a gloomy tower and had an enchanted black dog that he fed with flaming coals. He listened to Garabin's story stirring a gray cauldron all the while, and said, Do not fear. I will destroy both claimants to the throne at once. Garabin rubbed his hands together with glee. Tonight I shall cast a spell of sleep on Mariana, steal the crystal flask, empty it of the water of healing, and refill it with a liquid which will cause death within a night and a day. I shall then replace the flask before Mariana wakes. You will allow Mariana to visit the prince. She will touch him with the deadly water, and the prince will die. You can then try Mariana for having killed the prince, and condemn her to be thrown from the precipice. So pleased was Garabin with this horrid plot that he could have danced for joy. That very night, the magician filled Mariana's flask with the poisonous water and departed, thinking that nobody had noticed him. The yellow bird, however, had seen everything and followed the magician to note where he had hid the real water of healing. 
The next morning, Mariana was once more led before the king. Welcome, lovely maiden, said Garabin, with the most dreadful hypocrisy. I have long hoped that you would turn your footsteps hither, for my poor dear nephew, Prince Desire, only son of the late king, has been ill for some months of a malady no physician can cure. Perhaps you can cure him with the water of healing. Mariana replied that she would do her best to help the prince. So the court chamberlain gave her his arm and escorted her to the prince's room. The king and many courtiers followed after him. Desire lay in a great old-fashioned bed, his face flushed with fever. So weak was the poor prince that he could scarcely lift his head to look at his visitors. A great pity swept over Mariana's heart the instant she saw him, and as for Desire, he fell madly in love with Mariana at first sight. Now, just as Mariana bent over the prince to touch his forehead with the water of healing, the yellow bird screamed and cried as madly as if he were caught in a net. Mariana looked at the crystal flask. Nothing seemed changed. The water within seemed as pure and clear as ever. She touched the prince with the liquid. Alas, in a moment, so terrible was the magician's poison that the prince turned white as the driven snow and fell back on the pillows unconscious. The royal attendees, who had expected to see him spring up entirely cured, began to murmur, and Mariana herself, terrified at what had happened, let go of the flask which broke into a thousand sparkling pieces. Suddenly, Garabin cried at the top of his voice, Seize her. She has killed the prince. Presently, there was a great confusion. Rough hands seized Mariana, and somebody caught the yellow bird. The prince remained unconscious on the bed. At high noon, a trial was held, and since the doctors declared that the prince was dying, Mariana was condemned to be thrown from the precipice. When somebody asked about the yellow bird, Garabin laughed and gave orders that the cook should wring its neck and toss it to the cat. So Mariana was hurried to a dark prison room and loaded with chains, and the yellow bird was taken to the castle kitchen and given to the cook. By great good fortune, the cook's helper was no other than the peasant girl whom Mariana had saved. The girl recognized the yellow bird, and instead of wringing its neck, let it fly out of the window. The yellow bird flew to the window of the magician's room. The magician was in the chamber, stirring the giant cauldron. The bird flew to the window of Prince Desire's room and saw that he was still unconscious. An hour later, the castle bell began to toll, and a dismal procession was seen walking from the castle toward the frightful cliff from which condemned Mariana was to be thrown. First came a troop of soldiers, then Mariana weighted down with chains and last of all, Garabin and the evil magician. The bell kept on sadly tolling and tolling. It roused the prince from his swoon, and with his last measure of strength, poor desire dragged himself to the window. The procession was then passing directly underneath the window, and desire's eyes met the eyes of Mariana. Stop! Stop! cried the poor prince wildly. I forbid! An instant later, he sank fainting to the floor. The procession went on. Meanwhile, 
the yellow bird had returned to the magician's chamber. It was empty, and with a joyous cry, the bird fluttered through the window bars and discovered the vial into which the magician had poured the water of healing. Clutching it in his claws, the bird flew once more to the prince's room. Desire still lay in a heap by the window, and over him the yellow bird poured the contents of the phial. The prince sprang up, strong as a lion, seized his sword, and rushed down to save Mariana. He arrived at the cliff just as the poor maiden was about to be pushed off into space. Garabin, seeing his precious plot miscarry, grew mad with rage. Seize them, cried he, and tossed them both over the precipice. So the soldiers rushed at Mariana and the prince, intending to carry out their wicked master's orders. But even as they did so, there came a flash of flame, and the little dwarf, Mariana's foster father, took his place beside the lovers. Cruel king, cried the dwarf sternly, and thou, wicked magician, the hour of thy punishment is at hand. Immediately the sky grew black, the lightning crashed, and there arose a terrible howling wind. Two giant gusts drove fiercely by, the first one blowing the king head over heels over the precipice, and the second carrying away the evil magician. And when the sky cleared, only the dwarf, Mariana, and Desire were left of the company. Mariana, said the little dwarf, the Emperor of the Elves has told me all your history, and it is thanks to him that I have returned in time with the storm at my heels. You, Mariana, are the rightful queen of this country. Dear queen, said Prince Desire, let me be the first of your subjects to salute you. And he knelt before her and humbly kissed her hand. Nay, prince, said the young queen, answering the adoring look in her lover's eyes. Your father took the kingdom. If I were you, I should take the queen. Which was a bit forward, of course, but nobody minded that very much in those very times. So Desire and Mariana were married and lived happily ever after. The yellow bird went to the wedding, and when the ceremony was over, rose singing into the air and flew joyously home to the land of the elves. Once upon a time, the youngest son of a king desired to go abroad and see the world. He got his father's permission to depart, kissed his parents goodbye, mounted his black horse, and galloped away down the high road. Soon the grey towers of the old castle in which he was born hid themselves behind him. The prince journeyed on, spending the days in traveling and the nights in little wayside inns, till one day he found himself in the heart of the adamant mountains. The red granite cliffs of the surrounding peaks rose out of the gleaming snow like ugly fingers, and the slopes of giant glaciers sparkled in the sun like a cascade of diamonds. The prince sat down by some stunted trees whose tops had long before been broken off by an avalanche and began to eat the bit of bread and cheese which he had stored in his pocket. His black horse, meanwhile, ate the grass which grew here and there along the mountain path. And as the prince sat there in the bright sun and the silence of the mountains, 
he became aware of a low, continuous roaring. There must be a waterfall nearby, said the prince to himself. I'll go and see it. So, casting another look at his steed, who was contentedly browsing, the prince climbed up the mountainside in the direction of the sound. The prince climbed and climbed. He went in this direction and in that. Yet, the sound never grew any louder or fainter. Suddenly, he realized he was hopelessly lost. The little path up which he had ridden had vanished completely, and he hadn't the slightest idea in which direction it lay. He called out loud, but only the mountain echoes answered mockingly. Night came and the prince took shelter behind a great rock. All the next day he labored to find the path, but in vain. He grew very hungry and cold. Every once in a while he would hear the roaring of the waterfall, which seemed to have grown louder. Another day dawned, and another day again. The prince was getting very weak, he knew that he was approaching the mysterious cataract, for the noise of the water was now tremendous, and heaven and earth were full of its roar. The third night came, and the full moon rose solemnly over the snow-clad summits of the mysterious mountains. Suddenly the prince, walking blindly on, staggered through a narrow passageway between two cliffs and found himself face to face with the mystery. He stood on the snowy floor of a vast amphitheater whose walls were the steep sides of the giant mountains. Farthest away from him and opposite the moon, the wall of the bowl appeared as a giant black precipice whose top seemed to reach the stars. And over this precipice, a broad river was endlessly pouring, shimmering in the night like the overflow of an ocean of molten silver. Though now very weak from lack of food and dizzy with the roaring of the cataract, the prince made his way to the shore of the eddying lake into which the water was falling. Great was his surprise to discover that the overflow of this lake disappeared into the earth through an opening in the cliff behind the fall. Greater still was his surprise to see a great many colored lights burning within the cave. The prince made his way toward the light along a narrow beach of white sand lying between the wall of the cavern and the racing waters of the mysterious river. He found that the glow came from a lavish lantern studded with emeralds, amethysts, and rubies, hung by a chain from the roof of the grotto. Directly under this lantern, drawn up on the sand, lay a little boat with a lantern fastened to the bow. The prince pushed the boat into the river and got into it, and the swift current seized him and hurried him away. At first the cavern grew higher and wider, then it shrank again. The boat, sailing along with incredible speed, shot down a rocky passageway into the very heart of the earth. The passageway broadened once more, and the boat rowed gently through monstrous caves whose roofs were upheld by twisted columns taller than the tallest tree. There were times when all was so still that the prince could easily have imagined himself back in the solitude of the mountains. There were times when the foaming and roaring of the underground river grew so loud that the prince feared he might be approaching the brink of a subterranean cataract. Many hours passed. The prince did not know whether it was night or day. At length, while the boat was gliding through a vast hall 
he fell asleep. When he awoke, he found that the boat was floating on the black, glassy surface of an immense underground ocean. All signs of the cavern had disappeared. Far away, over the edge of this ocean, a strange, beautiful glow mounted into the starless sky of the underworld. And while the prince was gazing at the glow, the boat swung into a new current, gliding swiftly toward the light. In a short time, the light grew so wide and bright that one would have believed that the sun had risen. The boat passed between two giant marble pillars that supported enormous crystal globes filled with a golden fire. And at last, the prince found himself in the harbor of Lantern Land. A city lay before him, a strange golden city edging the shore of a vast semicircular bay. Because in the center of the earth there is neither sun nor moon, the people have to continually burn lights. So many and so great were the lanterns of Lantern Land that the town was as bright as day. The edge of the harbor was marked with a row of golden lanterns. There were immense lanterns at every six paces along the streets. A lantern hung from every house. The church towers, instead of having bells in them, had great golden lamps which illumined everything for some distance about. Moreover, every inhabitant of Lantern Land carried a lantern with him wherever he went. The rich carrying golden lanterns, the poor carrying lights of ordinary glass. Soon the prince saw a great ship coming out to meet him. The prow was carved in the shape of a dragon's head, and a beautiful lantern hung from its jaws. Overcome by hunger and fatigue, the poor prince at last fell unconscious on the floor of his little boat. When he came to his senses again, he was lying between sheets of the whitest, most delicate linen in a great four-poster bed in a room in the royal palace. Thanks to his kind hosts, the prince soon recovered his strength. When he was completely himself again, he was summoned to an audience with the Queen of Lantern Land. The queen, a very beautiful young woman, wearing a wonderful lantern crown, sat on an ebony throne. On each side of the throne stood a tall soldier, clad in scarlet and holding a long ebony staff surmounted by a round lantern lit by a golden flame. The prince dropped on his knee and thanked the queen for her kindness and hospitality. You are the first stranger to come to Lantern Land for a thousand years, said the young queen. Pray, how did you happen to find the river of the underworld? So the prince told her that he was a king's son and described his adventures in the mountains. You may be sure the queen was glad to hear of his royal birth, for she had become quite fond of the prince. A month passed. The prince remained a guest in the palace. All kinds of festivities were given in his honor. There were wonderful dances, masquerades, picnics and theatricals going on all the time. One day, the prince and the queen, accompanied by a little group of courtiers, rode to the frontier of Lantern Land. The lovers galloped ahead of the party and reached a little hill where there were no more lanterns. Ahead of them, the rolling land, sweeping farther and farther away from the light, grew darker and darker, 
till it finally plunged into the eternal night of the underworld. The prince looked at the queen and saw that she was weeping. Dear love, why do you weep? asked the prince, who felt sad to see tears in his lady's lovely eyes. I weep to think that in spite of our love, we must soon part forever, said the queen. Part forever? Dear lady, what can you mean? said the anxious prince. A cruel fate hangs over us, replied the lady. No, dear prince, that I am promised in marriage to the enchanter Dragondel, and that in exactly eight days he will come here to claim my hand. The enchanter Dragondel? Who is he? said the prince. Alas, said the queen, the enchanter Dragondel is the most powerful magician of all the underworld. He's about eight feet tall, has cruel sunken eyes that burn like smoldering embers, and dresses entirely in black. We met at a ball given by the king of the goblins. Dragondel pursued me with compliments. A few day afterwards, an iron boat arrived in the port of Lantern Land, having on board a giant blue dog who is Dragondel's younger brother. This terrible animal made his way to the palace and dropped at my feet a jeweled casket, which he carried between his jaws. The casket contained Dragondel's request for my hand and added that were I to refuse him, he would let loose a legion of ghosts and other winged spirits against the lanterns of Lantern Land. I had a vision of Lantern Land in darkness, of my poor subjects dying of fear and starvation. Rather than let this vision come true, I accepted the enchanter. Soon I shall never see you again, for Dragondel will come and take me to his awful castle which lies on an island in the dark ocean. Nor will you ever be able to save me, for Dragondel has so bewitched the waves that a terrible whirlpool forms on the sea and engulfs any boat that approaches the enchanted castle. But I can fight Dragondel, said the prince, like the brave youth that he was. That would be of little use, replied the queen, for you would be changed into a stone the instant you cross swords with him. Tomorrow the blue dog arrives to remind me of my obligation and to carry back to the island some of the palace servants who are to make Dragondel's castle ready for my coming. The other members of the party now rode up and the queen dabbed her eyes with her handkerchief, pretending not to have been crying. The prince and the queen felt very unhappy as they rode home. On the next day, sure enough, the iron boat arrived, and the blue dog, who was as large as a lion, went to the queen's palace and bade her make ready for the coming wedding. A dozen of the queen's servants were then ordered to go with the blue dog to Dragondel's castle. Among these servants, disguised as a kitchen lad, was the prince, for he had determined to see if there was not some way in which the young queen could be rescued from the wicked magician. The boat neared the island but no terrible whirlpool formed in the enchanted sea. At last, the boat reached Dragondel's castle. It stood on the top of a high, lonely rock where the waves of the underground ocean were forever foaming and breaking against the steep sides. It was all poorly lighted, but the prince could see that the castle was in ruins. The prince took his place in the kitchen and sought for an opportunity to prevent the marriage of Dragondel and the queen. For four days of the precious week, however, 
the poor prince was kept so busy baking and making pastries for the coming of the bride that he didn't have an instant to ask questions or do anything else. In the morning hours of the fifth day, there was a terrible moaning and roaring outside, and the cooks rushed to the kitchen windows. An unhappy fishing boat had been swept by the wind too near to Dragondel's castle, and the enchanted whirlpool had formed, catching the boat in its awful circle. Now it went slowly round the outer edge. Now going faster and faster, it slid down the side of the awful funnel, and finally it vanished. An instant later, the whirlpool had disappeared, leaving the sea roaring and foaming. The prince shuddered. Well, you may shudder, said the chief cook, for such would have been your fate if our master's brother had not carried with him the talisman which rules the whirlpool. Talisman? What talisman? said the prince, affecting stupidity. Why, the golden hand, you fool, said the chief cook. My, it must be a great big hand to be able to quiet that whirlpool, said the prince. Big indeed, you ninny, growled the cook. Why, the magic hand is only as big as a baby's hand. I've seen it many times. The master carries it in his pocket and puts it under his pillow while he sleeps. So, later on, when his work was done, and everybody had gone to bed, the prince, in the hope of stealing the talisman, tried to make his way to Dragondel's bedchamber. But when he reached the foot of the stairs, which led to the enchanter's room, he found it guarded by two black panthers which stared at him with insolent yellow eyes. The prince then went outdoors to see if there was any hope of climbing the room along the outer wall, and found that the windows of Dragondel's chamber overlooked a cliff falling thousands of feet sheer to the dark sea. Far, far away, the prince saw the glow of Lantern Land. Only a short time remained in which to save his beloved Lady of the Lanterns. As he wandered about, very sick at heart, he saw a little black cat running madly back and forth along the edge of a steep cliff, and from one of the crevices came a persistent, unhappy mewing. The poor cat was a mother cat and was trying to rescue a kitten of hers that had fallen down between the rocks. At great risk of being dashed to pieces himself, the brave prince climbed down the precipice, rescued the kitten, and gave it back to its anxious mother. Thank you, brave youth, said the old cat. May it someday be within my power to help you as you have helped me. You can help me this very moment, said the prince, and he told the cat who he was, why he had come to the castle, and of his desire to get possession of the talisman. I will help you get the talisman, said the cat. The panthers will let me pass, for they are cousins of mine. But you must make another little golden hand to take the place of the one I shall steal. For if Dragondel misses the golden hand, he will summon his demons to find it, and we shall both lose our lives. Go now to the kitchen. Carve a small hand with the fingers close together and the thumb lying close to the fingers. Gild it over with the gold dust you have for the pastry icings, and bring it to me tomorrow night at this very hour. So the prince worked the rest of the night, carving and gilding the little golden hand, and on the next night he gave it to the cat. The cat took it in her mouth as she would have a mouse, walked coolly by the panthers, and entered Dragondel's room. 
She had just succeeded in getting the true hand out from under the magician's pillow when Dragondel woke up. The cat was clever enough to pretend to be engaged in a mouse hunt, so the enchanter paid no attention to her and fell asleep once more. When the cat, however, got under Dragondel's couch again, the two hands lay side by side, and she could not remember just which one was the talisman and which one the false hand. So because she had to act quickly, she put one of the hands under the pillow, brought the other to the prince, and told him her story. But so well matched were the little hands that even the prince was far from certain that he had not got his own hand back again. And now came the seventh day, the day on which Dragondel, the blue dog, and all the wicked enchanter's friends were to sail to Lantern Land for the marriage ceremony. The iron ship, decorated with a thousand small scarlet lanterns, stood ready to carry them over. The enchanter and his company got in, and the vessel left the island. The prince stood watching the ship from the top of the cliffs. What anxiety was in his heart! If Dragondel still possessed the true talisman, he would cross the whirlpool safely and marry the beautiful queen of Lantern Land. The vessel sped on. It was now at some distance from the island. All is lost, thought the prince with a sinking heart. Dragondel has the true talisman. And in his bitterness, he was about to throw the little golden hand which lay in his pocket down into the dark sea. Suddenly, the air became filled with a terrible moaning. The sea became troubled. The whirlpool awoke, and the prince saw the enchanter's ship whirl round and round, faster and faster, till they disappeared forever in the waters of the sunless sea. As for the prince, he soon found another boat, and taking with him the talisman, his fellow servants, and the black cat and her kittens, he returned to Lantern Land married the queen, and together they lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, while riding, a brave young prince dashed merrily ahead of his friends, and after galloping across a plowed field, turned his horse's head down a grassy road leading to a wood. For some time he cantered easily along, expecting any moment to hear the shouts of his friends following after, but they by mistake took quite another road, and no sound except the pounding of his own horse's hoofs reached the prince's ears. Suddenly, an ugly snarl and a short bark broke the stillness of the pleasant forest, and looking down, the prince saw a grey wolf snapping at his horse's heels. Though the horse, wild with fear, threatened to run away any instant, the prince leaned over and struck the wolf with his whip. Hardly had he done so, when an angry voice cried, How dare you strike my pet! A little distance ahead, a wicked old witch stood at one side of the road, with its tail between its legs, the wolf cowered close to her skirts and showed its long yellow fangs. Pat indeed, cried the prince. Keep him away from my horse or I will strike him again. At your peril, prince, answered the witch. And then, as the prince turned his horse's head and galloped back, she called out, You shall rue this day. You shall rue this day. Now by the time the prince had arrived at the plowed field and the great road again, his friends had galloped on so far that they were lost to sight. 
thinking that he might overtake them by following a shorter road, he turned down a byway skirting the wood in which he had encountered the enchantress. Presently, he began to feel very thirsty. Chancing to see an old peasant woman in the fields, the prince called to her and asked where he could find a roadside spring. Now this old pleasant woman was the wicked witch under another form. Overjoyed at having the prince fall so easily into her power, she curtsied and replied that within the wood was to be found the finest spring in the country. Anxious not to lose time, the prince begged her to lead him to the water. Little did he know that the witch was leading him back into the wood and that she had just bewitched the water. When they arrived at the pool, the prince dismounted and kneeling by the brim, made a cup of his hands and drank till his thirst was satisfied. He was just about to seize his horse again by the bridle and put his foot into the stirrup when a terrible pang shot through his body. Darkness swam before his eyes. His arms lengthened and became branches. His fingers twigs. His feet shot into the ground and he found himself turned into a giant elm. A giant elm he was, a giant elm he remained. Unable to find him after a long search, his friends gave him up for lost and a new prince ruled over the land. Though the elm tried many times to tell passers-by of his plight, none ever seemed to understand his words. Again and again, when simple woodcutters ventured into the great dark wood, he would tell them his story and cry out, I am a prince, I am a prince. But the woodcutters heard only the wind stirring in the branches. Ah, how cold it was in winter when the skies were steely black and the giant stars sparkled icily and how pleasant it was when the spring returned and the gossipy birds came back again. The first year, a pair of wood pigeons took to housekeeping in his topmost branches. The prince was glad to welcome them, for though denied human speech, he understood the language of trees and birds. On Midsummer's Eve, the pigeons said to him, Tonight the king of the trees comes through the wood. Do you not hear the stir in the forest? All the real trees are preparing for the king's coming. They are shedding dead leaves and shaking out their branches. Tell me of the king, said the prince. He is tall and dark and strong, said the doves. He lives in the great pine in the north. On Midsummer Eve, he goes through the world to see if all is well with the tree people. Do you think he can help me? asked the prince. You might ask him, replied the doves. The long, long twilight of Midsummer Eve came to a close. Night folded the world beneath its starry curtains. At twelve o'clock, though not a breath of air was stirring, the trees were shaken as if by a mighty wind, the rustling of the leaves blending into strange and lovely music, and presently the king of the trees entered the haunted wood. Just as the wood doves had said, he was tall and dark and stately. Is all well with you, O oh my people? said the king in a voice as sweet and solemn as the wind in the branches on a summer's day. Yes, all is well, answered the tree softly. Then fare ye well, my people, till next Midsummer Eve, said the stately king. And he was about to stride onward through the dark wood 
when the enchanted prince called aloud to him. Stay, O king of the trees, cried the poor prince. Hear me, even though I am not of your people. I am a mortal, a prince, and a wicked witch has turned me into a tree. Can you not help me? Alas, my poor friend, I can do nothing, replied the king. However, do not despair. In my travels through the world, I shall surely find someone who can help you. Look for me on next Midsummer Eve. So the great elm swayed his branches sadly, and the king went on his way. The winter came again, silent and dark and cold. At the return of spring, a maiden who lived with a family of woodcutters came often to rest in the shade of the great tree. Her father had once been a rich merchant, but evil times had overtaken him, and at his death, the only relatives who could be found to take care of the little girl were a family of rough woodcutters in the royal service. These grudging folk kept the poor maiden always hard at work and gave her the most difficult household tasks. The prince, who knew the whole story, pitied her very much and ended falling quite in love with her. As for the unhappy maiden, it seemed to her that beneath the sheltering shade of the great elm, she enjoyed a peace and happiness to be found nowhere else. Now it was the custom of woodmen to cut down, during the summer, such trees as would be needed for the coming winter. And one day, the woodcutter in whose family the maiden lived announced his intention of cutting down the great elm. No, not the great elm which towers above all the forest, cried the maiden. Yes, that very tree, answered the woodcutter gruffly. Tomorrow morning we shall fell it to the ground, and tomorrow night we shall build the midsummer fire with its smaller branches. Oh, please don't cut the great elm, begged the good maiden. Nonsense, said the woodcutter. I wager you have been wasting your time under its branches. I shall certainly cut the tree down in the morning. All night long, you may be sure. The maiden pondered on the best way to save the great tree, and since she was as clever as she was good, she at length hit upon a plan. Rising early on midsummer morn, she ran to the forest, climbed the great elm, and concealed herself in its topmost branches. She saw the rest of the wood beneath her and the distant peaks of the adamant mountains, and she rejoiced in the songs of the birds. An hour after the sun had risen, she heard the voices of the woodcutter and his men as they came through the wood. Soon the band arrived at the foot of the tree. Imagine the feelings of the poor prince when he saw the sharp axes at hand to cut him down. I shall strike the first blow, said the chief woodcutter, and he lifted his axe in the air. Suddenly from the treetop, a warning voice sang, Throw the axe down, harm not me, I am an enchanted tree. He who strikes shall breathe his last before midsummer eve hath passed. There is a spirit in the tree, cried the woodcutters, thoroughly frightened. Let us hurry away from here before it does us a mischief. And all at once, the chief woodcutter's men ran away as fast as their legs could carry them. The chief woodcutter, however, was bolder hearted and lifted the axe again. As the blade shone uplifted in the sun, the maiden sang once more. Throw the axe down, harm not me, 
I am an enchanted tree. He who strikes shall breathe his last before midsummer eve hath passed. Hearing the voice again, the chief began to feel just the littlest bit alarmed. Nevertheless, he stood his ground and lifted the axe a third time. Once more the girl sang, Throw the axe down, harm not me, I am an enchanted tree. He who strikes shall breathe his last, before midsummer eve hath passed. At the same moment, the elm managed to throw down a great branch which struck the rogue a sound thump on the shoulders. Now, thoroughly terrified, the chief woodcutter himself fled from the spot. All day long, for fear lest he return, the maiden remained hidden in the tree. At twilight, overcome by weariness, she fell into a deep sleep. Just before midnight, alas, she was awakened from her slumber by hearing an angry voice cry, Come down from the tree, wicked, deceitful girl, or I shall cut it down at once. Very much alarmed, the poor maiden looked down through the branches and discovered the woodcutter standing at the foot of the elm. A lantern swung from his left hand, and his sharpest axe rested on his right shoulder. He had returned home, and not finding the maiden there, had suspected that it was her voice which had frightened his man away. Come down, roared the rascal. I'll teach you, you minx, to play tricks with me. One, two, three, and lifting the axe in the air, he was about to send it crashing into the trunk of the elm when the mysterious murmur which heralded the coming of the king of the trees sounded through the wood. Perplexed and frightened again, the chief woodcutter let fall his axe. Presently, he perceived two beings coming toward him through the solemn forest. Uttering a howl of fear, the rogue would have fled, but lifting his wand, the elder of the newcomers transfixed him to the spot. The two personages were the king of the trees and his friend, the mighty enchanter, Gorbadoc. Descend and fear not, maiden, said the king of the trees. You have done bravely and well. Your misfortunes are over, and a happier day is at hand. So the brave girl hurried down the tree and stood before the enchanter and the king. Very pretty she was, too, in her rustic dress and ribbons. Lifting his wand, Gorbadoc touched the trunk of the elm. There was a blinding flash of rosy fire. The great tree appeared to shrink and dissolve, and presently the prince stood before them. Welcome, prince, said the enchanter. Your enemy, the witch, will trouble you no more. I have turned her into an owl and given her to the queen of Lantern Land. As for you, and here the enchanter turned fiercely upon the woodcutter. You shall be a green monkey until you have planted and brought to full growth as many trees as you have cut down. An instant later, a green monkey swung off into the treetops. Then the grateful prince thanked the king of the trees, the mighty Gorbadoc, and the brave maiden with all his heart. I am glad to say that the prince got his castle back again, and he married the lovely maiden who had saved his life, and they lived happily ever after. When the vegetable man knocked, 
Jessamine went to the door wearily. She felt quite well acquainted with him. He had been coming all the spring, and his cheery greeting always left a pleasant afterglow behind him. But it was not the vegetable man after all, at least not the right one. This one was considerably younger. He was tall and sunburned, with a ruddy smiling face and keen pleasant blue eyes, and he had a spray of honeysuckle pinned on his coat. Want any garden stuff this morning? Jessamine shook her head. We always get ours from Mr. Bell. This is his day to come. Well, you won't see Mr. Bell for a while. He fell off a loft out at his place yesterday and broke his leg. I'm his nephew, and I'm going to fill his place till he gets round again. Oh, I'm so sorry for Mr. Bell, I mean. Have you any green peas? Yes, heaps of them. I'll bring them in. Anything else? Not today, said Jessamine, with a wistful glance at the honeysuckle. Mr. Bell Jr. saw her glance at it. In an instant, the honeysuckle was unpinned and handed to her. If you like posies, you're welcome to this. I guess you're fond of flowers, he added, as he noted the flash of delight that passed over her pale face. Yes, indeed, they remind me of home, of the country. Oh, how sweet this is. Your country bred, then, been in the city long? Since last fall, I was born and brought up in the country. I wish I was back. I can't get over being homesick. This honeysuckle seems to bring it right back. We had honeysuckles around our porch at home. You don't like the city then? Oh, no. I sometimes feel as if I should smother here. I shall never feel at home here, I'm afraid. Where did you live before you came here? Up at Middleton. It was an old-fashioned place, but pretty. Our house was covered with vines, and there were trees all about it, and great green fields beyond. But I don't know what makes me tell you this. I forgot I was talking to a stranger. Pretty little woman, Andrew Bell thought to himself as he drove away. She doesn't look happy, though. I suppose she's married some city chap and has to live in town. I guess I don't agree with her. Her eyes had a real hungry look in them over that honeysuckle. She seemed near about crying when she talked of the country. Jessamine felt more like crying than ever when she went back to her work. Her head ached and she was very tired. The tiny kitchen was hot and stifling. How she longed for the great, roomy kitchen in her old home, with its spotless floors and floods of sunshine streaming in through the maples outside. There was room to live and breathe there, and from the door one looked out over green meadows under a glorious arch of pure blue sky away to the purple hills in the distance. Jessamine Stacy had always lived in the country. When her sister died and the old home had to go, Jessamine could only accept the shelter offered by her brother, John Stacy, who did business in the city. Of her stylish sister-in-law, Jessamine was absolutely in awe. At first, Mrs. John was by no means pleased at the necessity of taking a country sister into her family circle. But one day, when the servant girl took a tantrum and left, Mrs. John found it very convenient to have in the house a person who could step into Eliza's place as promptly and efficiently as Jessamine could. Indeed, she found it so convenient that Eliza never had a successor. Jessamine found herself in the position of maid of all work and kitchen drudge for board and clothes. She never complained, 
but she grew thinner and paler as the winter went by. She had worked as hard on the farm, but it was the close confinement and weary routine that took a toll on her. Mrs. John was demanding and pettish. Her brother John was absorbed in his business worries and had no time to waste on his sister. Now, when the summer had come, her homesickness was almost unbearable. The next day, Mr. Bell came and handed her a big bunch of sweet briar roses. Here you are, he said heartily. I took the liberty to bring you these today, seeing you're so fond of posies. The country roads are pink with them now. Why don't you get your husband to bring you out for a drive someday? You'd be as welcome as a lark at my farm. I will when he comes along but I haven't seen him yet. Mr. Bell gave a prolonged whistle. Excuse me, I thought you were Mrs. Something or other for sure. Aren't you mistress here? Oh, no, my brother's wife is the mistress here. I'm only Jessamine. She laughed again. She was holding the roses against her face, and her eyes sparkled over them roguishly. Andrew Bell looked at her admiringly. You're a country rose yourself, miss, and you ought to be blooming out in the fields instead of wilting in here. I wish I was. Thank you so much for the roses, Mr. Mr. Bell. Andrew Bell. That's my name. I live out at Pine Pastures. We're all bells out there. Can't throw a stone without hitting one. Glad you like the roses. After that, he brought Jessamine a bouquet every trip. Sometimes he brought a bunch of field daisies or golden buttercups. Other times, a green glory of spicy ferns or a cluster of old-fashioned garden flowers. They keep life in me, Jessamine told him. They were great friends by this time. True, she knew little about him, but she felt instinctively that he was a gentleman and very kind-hearted. One day when he came, Jessamine met him gleefully. No, nothing today. There's no dinner to cook. You don't say. Where are the folks? Gone on an excursion. They won't be back until tonight. They won't? Well, I'll tell you what to do. You get ready. And when I'm through my rounds, we'll go for a drive up the country. Oh, Mr. Bell, but won't it be too much bother for you? Well, I reckon not. You want an excursion as well as other folks, and you shall have it. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I'll be ready. You don't know how much it means to me. Poor woman, thought Mr. Bell as he drove away. It's downright cruelty, that's what it is, to keep her penned up like that. You might as well coop up a lark in a hen house and expect it to thrive and sing. I'd like to give that brother of hers a piece of my mind. When he lifted her up to the high seat of his express wagon that afternoon, he said, Now, I want you to do something. Just shut your eyes and don't open them again until I tell you to. Jessamine laughed and obeyed. Finally, she heard him say, Look. Jessamine opened her eyes with a little cry. They were on a remote country road, cool and dim and quiet, in the very heart of the beech woods. Long banners of light fell across the gray boles. Along the roadsides grew sheets of feathery ferns, Above, the sky was gloriously blue. The air was sweet with the wild, woodsy smell of the forest. Jessamine lifted and clasped her hands in rapture. Oh, how lovely! Do you know where we're going? said Mr. Bell, delightedly. Out to my farm at Pine Pastures. My aunt keeps house for me, and she'll be real glad to see you. You're just going to have a real good time this afternoon. 
they had a delightful drive to begin with, and presently Mr. Bell turned into a wide lane. This is Cloverside Farm. I'm proud of it, I'll admit. There isn't a finer place in the country. What do you think of it? Oh, it is lovely. It is like home. Look at those great fields. I'd like to go lie down in that clover. Mr. Bell lifted her from the wagon and marched her up a flowery garden path. You shall do it, and everything else you want to. Here, aunt, this is the young lady I spoke of. Make her at home while I tend to the horses. Miss Bell was a pleasant-faced woman with silver hair and kind blue eyes. She took Jessamine's hand in a friendly fashion. Come in, dear. You're welcome as a June rose. When Mr. Bell returned, he found Jessamine standing on the porch with her hands full of honeysuckle and her cheeks pink with excitement. I declare you've got roses already, he exclaimed if they'd only stay now and not bleach out again. What would you like to do first? Oh, I don't know. There are so many things I want to do. Those flowers in the garden are calling me, and I want to go down to that hollow and pick buttercups, and I want to stay right here and look at things. Mr. Bell laughed. Come with me to the pasture and see my Jersey calves. There's something worth seeing. Come, aunt. This way, Miss Stacy. He led the way down the lane, the two women following together. Jessamine thought she must be in a pleasant dream. The whole afternoon was a feast of delight to her starved heart. When sunset came, she sat down, tired out but radiant, on the porch steps. Her hat had slipped back, and her hair was curling around her face. Her dark eyes were aglow. The roses still bloomed in her cheeks. Mr. Bell looked at her admiringly. If a man could only see that pretty sight every night, he thought. When the moon rose, Mr. Bell brought his team around, and they drove back through the clear night, past the wonderful stillness of the great beech woods and the wide fields. The farmer looked sideways at his companion. The little thing wants to be petted and looked after, he thought. She's just pining away for home and love, and why can't she have it? She's dying by inches in that hole back in town. Jessamine was living over again in fancy the joys of the afternoon the ramble in the pasture, the drink of water from the spring under the hillside pines, the bountiful old-fashioned country supper in the vine-shaped dining room, the cup of new milk in the dairy at sunset, and all the glory of the skies and meadows and trees. How could she go back to her cage again? The next week, Mr. Bell Sr. resumed his visits and the young farmer came no more to the side door of number 49. Jessamine missed him greatly. Mr. Bell Sr. never brought her clover or honeysuckle. But one day, his nephew suddenly reappeared. Jessamine opened the door for him, and her face lighted up, but Mr. Bell saw that she'd been crying. Did you think I had forgotten you? he asked. Not a bit of it. Harvest was on, and I couldn't get clear before. I've come to ask you when you intend to take another drive to Cloverside Farm. What have you been up to? You look as if you'd been working too hard. I... I haven't felt very well. I'm glad you came today, Mr. Bell. Perhaps I shall not see you again. I wanted to say goodbye and thank you for all your kindness. Goodbye? Why? Where are you going? My brother went west a week ago, faltered Jessamine. She could not bring herself to tell the clear-eyed farmer that John Stacy had failed 
and had been obliged to start for the West without saying goodbye to his creditors. His wife and I are going to next week. Oh, Jessamine, exclaimed Mr. Bell in despair. Don't go. You mustn't. I want you at Cloverside Farm. I came today on purpose to ask you. I love you, and I'll make you happy if you'll marry me. What do you say, Jessamine? Jessamine, by way of answer, sat down on the nearest chair and began to cry. Oh, don't, said the wooer in distress. I didn't want to make you feel bad. If you don't like the idea, I won't mention it again. Oh, it isn't that. But I... I thought nobody cared what became of me. You are so kind. I'm afraid I'd only be a bother to you. I'll risk that. You shall have a happy home, sweet girl. Will you come to it? Yes. It was very indistinct and faltering, but Mr. Bell heard it and considered it a most eloquent answer. Mrs. John fumed and sulked and chose to consider herself deceived and injured, but Mr. Bell was a resolute man and a few days later he came for the last time to number 49 and took his bride away with him. As they drove through the beech woods, he put his arm tenderly around the shy, smiling little woman beside him and said, You'll never be sorry for this, my dear. And she never was. When the telegram came from William George, Grandma Sheldon was all alone with Cyrus and Louise, and Cyrus and Louise, aged respectively 12 and 11, were not very much good, Grandma thought, when it came to advising what was to be done. Grandma was all in a flutter, dear oh dear, as she said. The telegram said that Delia, William George's wife, was seriously ill down at Green Village and William George wanted Samuel to bring Grandma down immediately. Delia had always thought there was nobody like Grandma when it came to taking care of the sick. But Samuel and his wife were both away, had been away for two days, and intended to be away for five more. They had driven to Sinclair, 20 miles away, to visit with Mrs. Samuel's folks for a week. Dear, oh dear, what shall I do? said Grandma. Go right to Green Village on the evening train, said Cyrus briskly. Dear, oh dear, and leave you two alone? cried Grandma. Louise and I will do very well until tomorrow, said Cyrus sturdily. We will send word to Sinclair by today's mail, and Father and Mother will be home by tomorrow night. But I've never been on a train in my life, protested Grandma nervously. I'm, I'm so frightened to go alone, and you never know what kind of people you might meet on the train. You'll be all right, Grandma. I'll drive you to the station, get your ticket, and put you on the train. Then you'll have nothing to do until the train gets to Green Village. I'll send a telegram to Uncle William George to meet you. I shall fall and break my neck getting off the train, said Grandma pessimistically but she was wondering at the same time whether she had better take the black valise or the yellow, and whether William George would be likely to have plenty of flaxseed in the house. It was six miles to the station, and Cyrus drove Grandma in time to catch a train that reached Green Village at nine o'clock. Dear, oh dear, said Grandma, what if William George's folks ain't there to meet me? It's all very well, Cyrus, to say that they will be there. But you don't know, and it's all very well to say not to be nervous because everything will be all right. If you were 75 years old and never set foot on a train in your life, you'd be nervous too. You can't be sure that everything will be all right. You never know what sort of people you'll meet on the train. I may get on the wrong train, or lose my ticket, or get carried past Green Village, or get my pocket picked. 
Well, no, I won't do that, for not one cent will I carry with me. You shall take back home all the money you don't need to get my ticket. Then I shall be easier in my mind. Dear, oh dear, if it wasn't that Delia is so seriously ill, I wouldn't go one step. Oh, you'll be all right, Grandma, assured Cyrus. He got Grandma's ticket for her, and Grandma tied it up in the corner of her handkerchief. Then the train came in, and Grandma, clinging closely to Cyrus, was put on it. Cyrus found a comfortable seat for her and shook hands cheerily. Goodbye, Grandma. Don't be frightened. Here's the weekly Argus. I got it at the store. You may like to look over it. And Cyrus was gone, and in a minute, the station house and platform began to glide away. Dear, oh dear, what has happened to it? thought Grandma in dismay. The next moment, she exclaimed aloud, Why, it's us that's moving, not it. Some of the passengers smiled pleasantly at Grandma. She was a type of old lady at which people do smile pleasantly. A grandma with round, pink cheeks, soft brown eyes, and lovely snow-white curls is a nice person to look at whenever she is found. After a while, Grandma, to her amazement, discovered that she liked riding on the train. It was not at all the disagreeable experience she had expected it to be. Why, she was just as comfortable as if she were in her own rocking chair at home. And there were so many people to look at, and many of the ladies had such beautiful dresses and hats. After all, the people you met on a train, thought Grandma, are surprisingly like the people you meet off it. If it had not been for wondering how she would get off at Green Village, Grandma would have enjoyed herself thoroughly. Four or five stations farther on, the train halted at a lonely-looking place consisting of the station house and a barn, surrounded by scrub woods and blueberry barrens. One passenger got on, and finding only one vacant seat in the crowded car, and sat right down beside Grandma Sheldon. Grandma Sheldon held her breath while she looked him over. Was he a pickpocket? He didn't appear like one, but you can never be sure of the people you meet on the train. Grandma remembered with a sigh of thankfulness that she had no money. Besides, he seemed very respectable and harmless. He was quietly dressed in a suit of dark blue serge with a black overcoat. He wore his hat well down on his forehead and was clean shaven. His hair was very black, but his eyes were blue. Nice eyes, Grandma thought. She always felt great confidence in a man who had bright, open blue eyes. Grandpa Sheldon, who had died so long ago, four years after their marriage, had had bright blue eyes. To be sure, he had had fair hair, reflected Grandma. It's real odd to see such black hair with such light blue eyes. Well, he's real nice looking, and I don't believe there's a mite of harm in him. The early autumn night had now fallen, and Grandma could not amuse herself by watching the scenery. She remembered the paper Cyrus had given her and took it out of her basket. It was an old weekly, a fortnight back. On the front page was a long account of a murder case, and into this Grandma plunged eagerly. Sweet old Grandma Sheldon, who would not have harmed a fly and hated to see even a mouse trap set, simply reveled in the newspaper accounts of murders. And the more shocking and cold-blooded they were, the more eagerly did Grandma read of them. This murder story was particularly good from Grandma's point of view. It was full of thrills. A man had been shot down, apparently in cold blood, and his supposed murderer was still at large and had eluded all the efforts of justice to capture him. His name was Mark Hartwell, and he was described as a tall, fair man with full auburn beard and curly, light hair. What a shocking thing, said Grandma aloud. Her companion looked at her with a kindly amused smile. What is it, he asked. 
Why, this murder at Charlotteville, answered Grandma, forgetting in her excitement that it was not safe to talk to people you meet on the train. It just makes my blood run cold to read about it. And to think that the man who did it is still around the country somewhere, plotting other murders I haven't a doubt. What is the good of the police? They're dull fellows, agreed the dark man. But I don't envy that man his conscience, said Grandma solemnly. What must a man feel like who has the blood of a fellow creature on his hands? Depend upon it, his punishment has begun already, caught or not. That is true, said the dark man quietly. Such a good looking man too, said Grandma, looking wistfully at the murderer's picture. It doesn't seem possible that he can have killed anybody. But the paper says there isn't a doubt. He's probably guilty, said the dark man, but nothing is known of his provocation. The affair may not have been so cold-blooded as the account states. Those newspaper fellows never err on the side of undercoloring. I really think, said Grandma slowly, that I would like to see a murderer, just one. Whenever I say anything like that, Adelaide, Adelaide is Samuel's wife, looks at me as if she thought there was something wrong about me. And perhaps there is, but I do, all the same. When I was a little girl, there was a man in our settlement who was suspected of poisoning his wife. She died very suddenly. I used to look at him with such interest, but it wasn't satisfactory, because you can never be sure whether he was really guilty or not. I never could believe that he was, because he was such a nice man in some ways, and so good and kind to children. I don't believe a man who was bad enough to poison his wife could have any good in him. Perhaps not, agreed the dark man. He had absent-mindedly folded up Grandma's old copy of the Argus and put it in his pocket. Grandma did not like to ask him for it although she would have liked to see if there were any more murder stories in it. Besides, just at that moment, the conductor came around for tickets. Grandma looked in the basket for her handkerchief. It was not there. She looked on the floor and on the seat and under the seat. It was not there. She stood up and shook herself. Still, no handkerchief. Dear, oh dear, exclaimed Grandma wildly. I've lost my ticket. I always knew I would. I told Cyrus I would. Oh, where can it be? The conductor scowled unsympathetically. The dark man got up and helped Grandma search, but no ticket was to be found. You'll have to pay the money then, and some extra, said the conductor gruffly. I can't. I haven't a cent of money, wailed Grandma. I gave it all to Cyrus because I was afraid my pocket would be picked. Oh, what shall I do? Don't worry, I'll make it all right, said the dark man. He took out his pocketbook and handed the conductor a bill. That grumbling conductor made the change and marched onward, while Grandma, pale with excitement and relief, sank back into her seat. I can't tell you how much I am obliged to you, sir, she said tremulously. I don't know what I should have done. Would he have put me off right here in the snow? I hardly think he would have gone to such lengths, said the dark man with a smile. But he's a cranky, disobliging fellow enough. I know him of old. And you must not feel overly grateful to me. I'm glad of the opportunity to help you. I had an old grandmother myself once, he added with a sigh. You must give me your name and address, of course, said Grandma, and my son Samuel Sheldon of Midburn will see that the money is returned to you. Well, this is a lesson to me. I'll never trust myself on a train again, and all I wish is that I was safely off this one. This fuss has worked my nerves all up again. Don't worry, Grandma. I'll see you safely off the train when we get to Green Village. Will you, though? Will you now? said Grandma eagerly. I'll be real easy in my mind then, she added with a returning smile. 
I feel as if I could trust you for anything, and I'm a real suspicious person too. They had a long talk after that, or rather, Grandma talked, and the dark man listened and smiled. She told him all about William George and Delia and their baby, and about Samuel and Adelaide and Cyrus and Louise and the three cats and the parrot. He seemed to enjoy her accounts of them too. When they reached Green Village Station, he gathered up Grandma's parcels and helped her tenderly off the train. Anybody here to meet Mrs. Sheldon? he asked of the station master. The latter shook his head. Don't think so. Haven't seen anybody here to meet anybody tonight. Dear, oh dear, said poor Grandma. This is just what I expected. They never got Cyrus's telegram. Well, I might have known it. What shall I do? How far is it to your sons? asked the dark man. Only half a mile, just over the hill there. But I'll never get there alone this dark night. Of course not, but I'll go with you. The road is good. We'll do fine. But that train won't wait for you, gasped Grandma, half in protest. It doesn't matter. The Star Mount Freight passes here in a half an hour, and I'll go on her. Come along, Grandma. Oh, but you're good, said Grandma. Some woman is proud to have you for a son. The man did not answer. He had not answered any of the personal remarks Grandma had made to him in her conversation. They were not long in reaching William George's house, for the village road was good and Grandma was smart on her feet. She was welcomed with eagerness and surprise. To think that there was no one to meet you, exclaimed William George. But I never dreamed of you coming by train, knowing how you were set against it. Telegram? No, I got no telegram. Suppose Cyrus forgot to send it. I'm most heartily obliged to you, sir, for looking after my mother so kindly. It was a pleasure, said the dark man courteously. He had taken off his hat, and they saw a curious scar shaped like a large red butterfly high up on his forehead under his hair. I am delighted to have been of any assistance to her. He would not wait for supper. The next train would be in and he must not miss it. There are people looking for me, he said with a curious smile. They will be much disappointed if they do not find me. He had gone, and the whistle of the Starmount Freight had blown before Grandma remembered that he had not given her his name and address. Dear, oh dear, how are we ever going to send that money to him, she exclaimed, and he is so nice and good-hearted. Grandma worried over this for a week in the intervals of looking after Delia. One day, William George came in with a large city daily in his hands. He looked curiously at Grandma and then showed her the front page picture of a man, clean shaven, with an oddly shaped scar high up on his forehead. Did you ever see that man, Mother? he asked. Of course I did, said Grandma excitedly. Why, it's the man I met on the train. Who is he? What is his name? That is Mark Hartwell, who shot Amos Gray at Charlotteville three weeks ago said William George quietly. Grandma looked at him blankly for a moment. It couldn't be, she gasped at last. That man a murderer? I'll never believe it. It's true enough, Mother. The whole story is here. He had shaved his beard and dyed his hair and came near getting clear out of the country. They were on his trail the day he came down on the train with you and lost it because of his getting off to bring you here. His disguise was so perfect that there was little fear of his being recognized so long as he hid that scar. But it was seen in Montreal, and he was run to the earth there. He has made a full confession. I don't care, said Grandma. I'll never believe he was all bad. A man who would do what he did for a poor old woman like me when he was flying for his life too. No, no, there was good in him, even if he did kill that man, and I'm sure he must feel terrible over it. In this view, Grandma persisted. 
She never would say or listen to a word against Mark Hartwell, and she had only pity for him whom everyone else condemned. With her own trembling hands, she wrote him a letter to accompany the money Samuel sent before Hartwell was taken to the penitentiary for life. She thanked him again for his kindness to her and assured him that she knew he was sorry for what he had done and that she would pray for him every night of her life. Mark Hartwell had been hard and defiant enough, but the prison officials told that he cried like a child over Grandma Sheldon's little letter. There's nobody all bad, says Grandma when she relates the story. I used to believe a murderer must be, but I know better now. I think of that poor man often. He was so kind and gentle to me. He must have been a good boy once. I write him a letter every Christmas and I send him tracts and papers. He's my own little charity, but I've never been on the train since and I never will be again. You can never tell what will happen to you or what sort of people you'll meet on a train. Hello and welcome. I'm Joanne and thank you so much for joining me. Tonight's story is called The Wonderful Ring by Flora Annie Steele and I hope you enjoy it. Know that as you focus on the narration of the story, while engaging your imagination as you follow along, your mind will slowly begin to shift from being fully awake to a slower brainwave state, a calm, relaxed, dreamy state that will help you drift down, all the way down, into a sound and restful sleep. And so let's begin this peaceful journey from wakefulness to dreamy relaxation by taking a few letting go breaths. Breathing into a comfortable fullness. Holding briefly at the top. And then letting go. Letting go of the breath. Letting go of tension. Letting go of the day. And now just doing a few more letting go breaths in this way. Sending a message, letting your body and mind know that it's safe to relax. Feel the weight of your body, letting go, sinking down, deeper and deeper down into your bed, snuggling all the way down under the covers, feeling cozy, feeling safe, feeling calm and relaxed. And now imagine a feeling of relaxation beginning to flow down like warm honey, flowing down from the top of your head all the way down to the tips of your toes and spreading all the way to the edges of your body bringing warmth and relaxation to every part of you, giving way to this feeling of relaxation as it washes over you, helping you sink deeper and deeper down. And as you listen to the story and as you follow my voice, this feeling will follow you and your relaxation will only deepen with each word I read. With each word I read, you will feel more and more calm, more and more relaxed, sinking down into this wonderful feeling of drifting and letting go. And when this story comes to an end, you will continue to drift feeling calm and relaxed, going deeper and deeper down, all the way down into a sound and restful sleep, a 
sound and restful sleep. But for now, my friend, just enjoy this feeling of dreamy relaxation, knowing that it will follow you as we now begin our story. Once upon a time, there lived a king who had two sons, and when he died, he left them all his treasures. But the younger brother began to squander it all so lavishly that the elder brother said, Let us divide the treasures, and you take your own share and do what you please with it. So the younger brother took his portion, and he went on his way until he met a man with a cat. How much for your cat? asked the prince. Nothing less than a golden pound, replied the man. A bargain indeed, cried the prince, and immediately bought the cat for a golden sovereign. By and by, he met a man with a dog and called out as before, How much for your dog? And when the man said not less than a golden pound, the prince again declared it was a bargain indeed and bought it cheerfully. Then he met a man carrying a parrot and called out as before, How much for the parrot? And when he heard it was only a golden sovereign, he was delighted, saying once again it was a bargain indeed. He had only one pound left, yet even then when he met a man carrying a serpent, he cried out at once, How much for the snake? Nothing less than a golden sovereign, said the man. And very little too, cried the prince, handing over his last coin. So there he was, possessed of a cat, a dog, a parrot, and a snake, but not a single penny in his pocket. However, he set to work bravely to earn his living, but the hard labor wearied him dreadfully. For being a prince, he was not used to it. Now when his serpent saw this, he felt sorry for his master and said, Prince, if you're not afraid to come to my father's house, he will perhaps give you something for saving me from that man. The prince was not a bit afraid of anything, so he and the serpent set off together. But when they arrived at the house, the snake bade the prince wait outside, while it went in alone and prepared the snake father for a visitor. When the snake father heard what the serpent had to say, he was much pleased, declaring he would reward the prince by giving him anything he desired. So the serpent went out to fetch the prince into the snake father's presence, and when doing so, it whispered in his ear. My father will give you anything you desire. Remember only to ask for his little ring as a keepsake. This rather astonished the prince, who naturally thought a ring would be of little use to a man who was half starving. However, he did as he was bid, and when the snake father asked him what he desired, he replied, Thank you, but I have everything and want for nothing. Then the snake father asked him once more what he would take as a reward, but again he answered that he wanted nothing, having all that heart could desire. Nevertheless, when the snake father asked him the third time, he replied, Since you wish me to take something, let it be the ring you wear on your finger as a keepsake. Then the snake father frowned and looked displeased, saying, Were it not for my promise, I would have turned you into ashes on the spot for daring to ask for my greatest treasure. But as I have said it, it must be. Take the ring and go. So the prince, taking the ring, set off homewards with his servant the serpent, to whom he said regretfully, This old ring is a mistake. I have only made the snake father angry by asking for it, and much good it will do me. It would have been much wiser to ask for a sack of gold. 
Not so, my prince, replied the serpent. That ring is a wonderful ring. You have only to make a clean square place on the ground, plaster it over according to the custom of holy places, put the ring in the center, sprinkle it with buttermilk, and then whatever you wish for will be granted immediately. Vastly delighted at possessing so great a treasure as this magic ring, the prince went on his way rejoicing. But by and by, as he trudged along the road, he began to feel hungry and thought he would put his ring to the test. So, making a holy place, he put the ring in the center, sprinkled it with buttermilk, and cried, O oh, ring, I want some sweetmeats for dinner. No sooner had he uttered the words than a dish full of the most delicious sweets appeared on the holy place. These he ate and then set off to a city he saw in the distance. As he entered the gate, a proclamation was being made that anyone who would build a palace of gold with golden stairs in the middle of the sea in the course of one night should have half the kingdom and the king's daughter in marriage. But if he failed, instant death should be his portion. Hearing this, the prince went at once to the court and declared his readiness to fulfill the conditions. The king was much surprised at his temerity and bade him consider well what he was doing telling him that many princes had tried to perform the task before and showing him a necklace of their heads in hopes that the dreadful sight might deter him from his purpose. But the prince merely replied that he was not afraid and that he was certain he should succeed. The king ordered him to build the palace that very night and setting a guard over him bade the sentries be careful the overly confident young man did not run away. Now when evening came, the prince lay down calmly to sleep. The guards whispered amongst themselves that he must be a madman to fling away his life so uselessly. Nevertheless, with the first streak of dawn, the prince arose, and making a holy place, laid the ring in the center, sprinkled it with buttermilk, and cried, O oh, ring, I want a palace of gold with golden stairs in the midst of the sea. And lo, there in the sea it stood, all glittering in the sunshine. Seeing this, the guard ran to tell the king, who could scarcely believe his eyes when he and all his court came to the spot and beheld the golden palace. Nevertheless, as the prince had fulfilled his promise, the king performed his and gave his daughter in marriage and half his kingdom to the prince. I don't want your kingdom or your daughter either, said the prince. I will take the palace I have built in the sea as my reward. So he went to live there, but when they sent the princess to him, he relented, seeing her beauty, and so they were married and lived very happily together. When the prince went out a-hunting, he took his dog with him, but he left the cat and the parrot in the palace to amuse the princess. Nevertheless, one day when he returned, he found her very sad and sorrowful, and when he begged her to tell him what was the matter, she said, Oh, my dear prince, I wish to be turned into gold by the power of the magic ring by which you built this glittering golden palace. So to please her, he made a holy place, put the ring in the center, sprinkled it with buttermilk, and cried, Oh, ring! turn my wife into gold. 
No sooner had he said the words than his wish was accomplished and his wife became a golden princess. When the golden princess was washing her beautiful golden hair one day, two long glittering hairs came out in the comb. She looked at them, regretting that there were no poor people near to whom she might have given the golden strands. Determining they should not be lost, she made a cup of green leaves and curling the hairs inside it, set it afloat upon the sea. As luck would have it, after drifting here and there, it reached a distant shore where a washerman was at work. The poor man, seeing the wonderful golden hairs, took them to the king, hoping for a reward and the king in his turn showed them to his son, who was so much struck by the sight that he lay down on a dirty old bed to mark his extreme grief and despair, and, refusing to eat or drink anything, swore he must marry the owner of the beautiful golden hair or die. The king, greatly distressed at his son's state, cast about how he should find the golden-haired princess, and after calling his ministers and nobles to help him, came to the conclusion that it would be best to employ a wise woman. So he called the wisest woman in the land to him, and she promised to find the princess on condition of the king in his turn, promising to give her anything she desired as a reward. Then the wise woman caused a golden barge to be made, and in the barge a silken cradle swinging from silken ropes. When all was ready, she set off in the direction whence the leafy cup had come, taking with her four boatmen whom she trained carefully always to stop rowing when she put up her finger and go on as long as she kept it down. After a long while, they came in sight of the golden palace, which the wise woman guessed at once must belong to the golden princess. So, putting up her finger, the boatman ceased rowing, and the wise woman, stepping out of the boat, went swiftly into the palace. There she saw the golden princess, sitting on a golden throne, and going up to her, she laid her hands upon the princess's head, as is the custom when relatives visit each other. Afterwards, she kissed her and petted her, saying, Dearest niece, do you not know me? I'm your aunt. But the princess at first drew back and said she had never seen or heard of such an aunt. Then the wise woman explained how she had left home years before and made up such a cunning, plausible story that the princess, who was only too glad to get a companion, really believed what she said and invited her to stay a few days in the palace. Now as they sat talking, the wise woman asked the princess if she did not find it dull alone in the palace in the midst of the sea and inquired how they managed to live there without servants and how the prince, her husband, came and went. Then the princess told her about the wonderful ring the prince wore day and night, and how by its help they had everything their hearts could desire. On this, the pretended aunt looked very grave and suggested the terrible plight in which the princess would be left should the prince come to harm while away from her. She spoke so earnestly that the princess became quite alarmed, and the same evening, when her husband returned, she said to him, Husband, I wish you would give me the ring to keep while you are away a-hunting, for if you were to come to harm, what would become of me all alone here in this sea palace? So next morning, when the prince went a-hunting, he left the magical ring in his wife's keeping. 
As soon as the wicked wise woman knew that the ring was really in the possession of the princess, she persuaded her to go down the golden stairs to the sea and look at the golden boat with the silken cradle. By coaxing words and cunning arts, the golden princess was inveigled into the boat in order to have a tiny sail on the sea. But no sooner was her prize safe in the silken cradle than the wise woman turned down her finger and the boatman immediately began to row swiftly away. Soon the princess begged to be taken back, but the wise woman only laughed and answered all the poor girl's tears and prayers with slaps and harsh words. At last, they arrived at the royal city, where great rejoicings arose when the news was noised abroad that the wise woman had returned with the golden bride for the lovesick prince. Nevertheless, despite all entreaties, the princess refused even to look at the prince for six months, and if in that time, she said, her husband did not claim her, she might then consider marriage, but until then she would not hear of it. To this the prince agreed, seeing that six months was not a very long time to wait. Besides, he knew that even should her husband or any guardian turn up, nothing was easier than to kill them. Meanwhile, the prince, having returned from hunting, called out as usual to his wife on reaching the golden stairs, but received no answer. Then, entering the palace, he found no one there save the parrot, which flew towards him and said, O oh, master, the princess's aunt came here and has carried her off in a golden boat. Hearing this, the poor prince fell to the ground in a fit and would not be consoled. At last, however, he recovered a little when the parrot, to comfort him, bade him wait there while it flew away over the sea to gather news of the lost bride. So the faithful parrot flew from land to land, from city to city, from house to house, until it saw the glitter of the princess's golden hair. Then it fluttered down beside her and bidding her to be brave, for it had come to help her, asking for the magic ring, whereupon the golden princess wept more than ever for she knew the wise woman kept the ring in her mouth day and night and that none could take it from her. However, when the parrot consulted the cat which had accompanied the faithful bird, the crafty creature declared nothing could be easier. All the princess has to do, said the cat, is to ask the wise woman to give her rice for supper tonight. And instead of eating it all, she must scatter some in front of the rat hole in her room. The rest is my business and yours. So that night, the princess had rice for supper, and instead of eating it all, she scattered some before the rat hole. Then she went to bed and slept soundly, and the wise woman snored beside her. By and by, when all was quiet, the rats came out to eat up the rice, when the cat, with one bound, pounced on the one which had the longest tail, and carrying it to where the wise woman lay snoring with her mouth open, thrust the tail up her nose. She woke with a most terrific sneeze, and the ring flew out of her mouth onto the floor. Before she could turn, the parrot seized it in his beak and, without pausing a moment, flew back with it to his master the prince, who had nothing to do but make a holy place, lay the ring in the center, sprinkle it with buttermilk and say, O oh, ring, I want my wife. And there she was, as beautiful as ever and overjoyed at seeing the golden palace 
and her dear husband once more. Down by the sea lived Ben the fisherman with his wife and little son who was called Dandelion because of his curly yellow hair that covered his head with a golden fuzz. A very happy family, for Ben was kind and industrious. Hetty, his wife, a cheerful, busy creature, and Dandelion, the jolliest three-year-old baby who always made sand pies and paddled on the beach. But one day, a great trouble came to them. Ben and his fellow fishermen sailed blithely away as usual, as Hetty watched the fleet of boats out of the bay, thinking how pretty they looked with the sunshine on them, while Dandelion stood clapping his chubby hands and saying as he always did, Daddy, come in soon. But Daddy did not come soon that time, for a great storm arose. And when some of the boats came scudding home at nightfall, Ben's was not among them. All night the gale raged, and in the morning, Ben's boat lay empty and broken on the shore. His mates shook their heads when they saw the wreck, and drew their rough hands over their eyes, for Ben was a good seaman, and they knew he would never desert his boat alive. They looked for him far and wide, but could hear nothing of him and felt sure that he had perished in the storm. They tried to comfort poor Hetty, but she would not be comforted. Her heart seemed broken, and if it had not been for her baby, her neighbors feared that she would have gone to join Ben in his grave under the sea. Dandelion didn't understand why everyone was so sad and why his father stayed away so long but he never lost his cheerfulness, never gave up hoping, or stopped saying with a contented smile, Daddy, come in soon. The sunshiny little face was Hetty's only comfort. The sight of the fuzzy yellow head bobbing around the house alone made it endurable, and the touch of her loving baby hands kept her from the despair which made her long to end her sorrow in the sea. People don't believe in fairies nowadays. Nevertheless, good spirits still exist and help us in our times of trouble, even better than the little people we used to read about. One of these household spirits is called love, and it took the shape of dandelion to comfort poor Hetty. Another is called labor, a beautiful happy spirit this is, and it did its part so well that there was little time for bitter thoughts or vain regrets. For Hetty's spinning wheel must go in order to earn bread for Dandelion, whose mouth was always ready for food, like a hungry bird. Busily hummed the wheel, and, as it flew, it seemed to catch an echo of the baby's cheerful song, saying over and over, Daddy, come in soon, till Hetty stopped crying as she worked and listen to the cheerful whirr. Yes, I shall see my good Ben again if I wait patiently. Baby takes comfort in saying that, and I will too, though the poor dear will get tired of it soon, she said. But Dandelion didn't get tired. He firmly believed what he said, and nothing could change his mind. He had been much troubled at seeing the boat laid up on the beach all broken and dismantled, but his little mind couldn't take in the idea of shipwreck and death. So, after thinking it over, he decided that Daddy was waiting somewhere for a new boat to be sent to bring him home. This idea was so strong that the child gathered together all of his toy boats, for he had many, as they were his favorite plaything, and launched them one after another, telling them to find his father and bring him home. As Dandelion was not allowed to play on the beach except at low tide, the little boat sailed safely away on the receding waves, and the child was sure that some of them would get safely into the distant port where Daddy was waiting. All the boats were launched at last, 
all sailed bravely away, but none came back, and little Dandy was much disappointed. He babbled about it to himself, told the peeps and the horseshoes, the snails and the lobsters of his trouble, begged the gulls to fly away and find Daddy. And every windy night when the sea dashed on the shore and the shutters rattled, he would want the lamp put in the window as it used to be when they'd expect Ben and try to make home look cheerful even before he got there. Hetty used to humor the child, though it made her heart ache to know that the light shone in vain. At times, Dandy would prance about the room in his little shirt and talk about Daddy as happily as if long months had not passed without bringing him back. In his big, old-fashioned cradle, the boy would lie, looking more like a dandelion than ever in his yellow flannel nightgown, playing with his toes or rocking himself to and fro, calling the cradle his boat, and blithely telling his mother that he was sailing far away to find Daddy. When tired of play, he lay still and asked her to sing to him. She had no heart for the happy old sea song she used to sing for lullabies, so she sung hymns in her soft, motherly voice till the blue eyes closed and the golden head lay still, looking so pretty with the circle of bright hair above the rosy face. My little saint, Hetty called him, and though she often wept sadly as she watched him, the bitterness of her grief passed away and a patient hope came to her, for the child's firm faith impressed her deeply. The pious music of the sweet old hymns comforted her sore heart, and daily labor kept her cheerful in spite of herself. The neighbors wondered at the change that came over her, but she could not explain it, and no one knew that the three good spirits called love, labor, and hope were working their pleasant miracles. Six long months went by, and no one ever thought of seeing Ben again. No one but his little son, who still watched for him here, and his wife, who waited to meet him hereafter. One spring day, something happened. The house was as tidy as ever. The wheel hummed briskly as Hetty sung softly to herself with a cheerful face though there were white hairs among the brown and her eyes had a thoughtful, absent look at times. Dandelion, more chubby and cheery than ever, sat at her feet, with the sunshine making a golden glory of his yellow hair as he tried his new boat in the tub of water his mother kept for her little sailor, or tugged away with his fat fingers at a big needle which he was trying to pull through a bit of cloth intended for a sail. The faithful little soul had not forgotten his father, but had come to the conclusion that the reason his boats never prospered was because they hadn't large enough sails, so he was intent on rigging a new boat that was recently given to him with a sail that could not fail to waft Ben safely home. With his mouth puckered up, his downy eyebrows knit, and both hands pulling at the big needle he was so wrapped in his work that he didn't mind the stopping of the wheel when Hetty fell into a daydream, thinking of the happy time when she and Ben should meet again. Sitting so, neither heard a step come softly over the sand. Neither saw an eager brown face peer in at the door, and neither knew for a minute that Ben was watching them with a love and longing in his heart that made him tremble. Dandelion saw him first, for as he pulled the thread through with a triumphant jerk, he lost his balance, tumbled over, and lay staring up at the tall man with his blue eyes so wide open they looked as if they would never shut again. All of a sudden, he shouted with a joyful shout, Daddy's tummin! And the next instant, vanished ship and all in the arms of the man who wore the rough jacket. Over went the spinning wheel, 
as Hetty vanished likewise, and for a time there was nothing but sobbing and kissing, clinging and thanking heaven for its kindness to them. When they grew quieter, and Ben got into his old chair, with his wife on one knee and his boy on the other, he told them how he was wrecked in the gale, picked up by a ship, and only able to get back after months of sickness and delay. My Bodhi fetched him, said Dandelion, feeling that everything had turned out just as he expected. So it did, my precious. Least ways your faith helped, I haven't a doubt, cried Hetty, hugging the curly-headed child close as she told Ben all that had happened. Ben didn't say much, but a few great tears rolled down the rough blue jacket as he looked from the strange sail with its two big stitches to the little son, whose love he firmly believed had kept him safe through many dangers and brought him home at last. When the fine new boat was built, no one thought it strange that Ben named it Dandelion. No one laughed at the little sail which always hung over the fireplace in the small house. And long years after, when Ben was an old man and sat by the door with his grandchildren on his knee, the story which always pleased them best was that which ended with the funny words, Daddy Tumminson. I'm so glad tomorrow is Christmas because I'm going to have lots of presents. So am I glad, though I don't expect any presents but a pair of mittens. And so am I, but I shan't have any presents at all. As the three little girls trudged home from school, they said these things. And as Tilly spoke, both the others looked at her with pity and some surprise, for she spoke cheerfully and they wondered how she could be happy when she was so poor she could have no presents on Christmas. Don't you wish you could find a purse full of money right here in the path, said Kate, the child who was going to have lots of presents. Oh, don't I, if I could keep it honestly, and Tilly's eyes shone at the very thought. What would you buy, asked Bessie, rubbing her cold hands and longing for her mittens. I'd buy a pair of large, warm blankets, a load of wood, a shawl for my mother, and a pair of shoes for me. And if there was enough left, I'd give Bessie a new hat, and then she needn't wear Ben's old felt one, answered Tilly. The girls laughed at that, but Bessie pulled the funny hat over her ears and said she was much obliged, but she'd rather have candy. Let's look. And maybe we can find a purse. People are always going about with money at Christmas time, and someone may lose it here, said Kate. So, as they walked along the snowy road, they looked about them, half in earnest, half in fun. Suddenly, Tilly sprang forward, exclaiming, I see it. I found it. The others followed, but all stopped disappointed for it wasn't a purse, it was only a little bird. It lay upon the snow with its wings spread and feebly fluttering, as if too weak to fly. Its little feet were benumbed with cold, its once bright eyes were dull with pain, and instead of a blithe song, it could only utter a faint chirp now and then, as if crying for help. Nothing but a stupid old robin how provoking, cried Kate, sitting down to rest. I shan't touch it. I found one once and took care of it, and the ungrateful thing flew away the minute it was well, said Bessie, creeping under Kate's shawl and putting her hands under her chin to warm them. Poor little birdie, how pitiful he looks, and how glad he must be to see someone coming to help him. I'll pick him up gently and carry him home to mother. Don't be frightened, dear. I'm your friend. And Tilly knelt down in the snow, stretching her hand to the bird with the tenderest pity in her face. 
Don't stop for that thing. It's getting late and cold. Let's go on and look for the purse, they said, moving away. You wouldn't leave it to die, cried Tilly. I'd rather have the bird than the money, so I shan't look anymore. The purse wouldn't be mine, and I should only be tempted to keep it. But this poor thing will thank and love me, and I'm so glad I came in time. Gently lifting the bird, Tilly felt its tiny cold claws cling to her hand and saw its dim eyes brighten as it nestled down with a grateful chirp. Now I've got a Christmas present after all, she said, smiling as they walked on. I always wanted a bird, and this one will be such a pretty pet for me. He'll fly away the first chance he gets and die anyhow, so you'd better not waste your time over him, said Bessie. He can't pay for you taking care of him, and my mother says it isn't worthwhile to help folks that can't help us, added Kate. My mother says, do as you'd be done by, and I'm sure I'd like anyone to help me if I was dying of cold and hunger. Love your neighbor as yourself is another of her sayings. This bird is my little neighbor, and I'll love and care for him as I often wish our rich neighbor would love and care for us, answered Tilly, breathing her warm breath over the benumbed bird, who looked up at her with confiding eyes, quick to feel and know a friend. What a funny girl you are, said Kate, caring for that silly bird and talking about loving your neighbor in that sober way. Mr. King don't care a bit for you and never will, though he knows how poor you are, so I don't think your plan amounts to much. I believe it, though, and shall do my part anyway. Good night. I hope you'll all have a Merry Christmas and lots of pretty things, answered Tilly as they parted. Her eyes were full, and she felt so poor as she went on alone toward the little old house where she lived. It would have been so pleasant to know that she was going to have some of the pretty things all children love to find in their full stockings on Christmas morning, and pleasanter still to have been able to give her mother something nice. So many comforts were needed, and there was no hope of getting them, for they could barely get food and fire. Never mind, Bertie, we'll make the best of what we have and be merry in spite of everything. You shall have a happy Christmas anyway, and I know God won't forget us if everyone else does. She stopped a minute to wipe her eyes and lean her cheek against the bird's soft breast, finding great comfort in the little creature, though it could only love her and nothing more. See, mother, what a nice present I found, she cried going in with a cherry face that was like sunshine in the dark room. I'm glad of that, dearie, for I haven't been able to get my little girl anything but a rosy apple. Poor bird, give it some of your warm bread and milk. Why, mother, what a big bowlful. I'm afraid you gave me all the milk, said Tilly, smiling over the nice steaming supper that stood ready for her. I've had plenty, dear. Sit down and dry your wet feet and put the bird in my basket on this warm flannel. Tilly peeped into the closet and saw nothing there but dry bread. Mother's given me all the milk and is going without her tea because she knows I'm hungry. Now I'll surprise her and she'll have a good supper too. She's going to split wood and I'll fix it while she's gone. So Tilly put down the old teapot, carefully poured out part of the milk, and from her pocket produced a great plummy bun that one of the school children had given her and she had saved for her mother. A slice of the dry bread was nicely toasted and the bit of butter set by her put on it. When her mother came in, there was the table drawn up in a warm place, a hot cup of tea ready and Tilly and Bertie waiting for her. Such a poor little supper, and yet such a happy one, for love, charity, and contentment were guests here, 
and that Christmas Eve was a simple one than that up at the great house, where lights shone, fires blazed, and a great tree glittered, and music sounded as the children danced and played. We must go to bed early, for we've only wood enough to last over tomorrow. I shall be paid for my work the day after, and then we can get some, said Tilly's mother as they sat by the fire. If my bird was only a fairy bird and would give us three wishes, how nice it would be. Poor dear, he can't give me anything. But it's no matter, answered Tilly, looking at the robin who lay in the basket with his head under his wing. He can give you one thing, Tilly, the pleasure of doing good. That is one of the sweetest things in life, and the poor can enjoy it as well as the rich. As her mother spoke, with her tired hand softly stroking her daughter's hair, Tilly suddenly started and pointed to the window, saying in a frightened whisper, I saw a face, a man's face looking in. It's gone now, but I truly saw it. Some traveler attracted by the lights, perhaps. I'll go and see. And Tilly's mother went to the door. No one was there. The wind blew cold, the stars shone, the snow lay white on field and wood, and the Christmas moon was glittering in the sky. What sort of face was it? asked Tilly's mother, coming back. A pleasant sort of face, I think, but I was so startled I don't quite know what it was like. I wish we had a curtain there, said Tilly. I like to have our light shine out in the evening, for the road is dark and lonely just here and the twinkle of our lamp is pleasant to people's eyes as they go by. We can do so little for our neighbors. I am glad to cheer the way for them. Now put those poor old shoes to dry and go to bed, dearie. I'll come soon. Tilly went, taking her bird with her to sleep in his basket nearby, lest he should be lonely in the night. Soon the little house was dark and still and no one saw the Christmas spirits at their work that night. When Tilly opened the door next morning, she gave a loud cry, clapped her hands, and then stood still, quite speechless with wonder and delight. There, before the door, lay a great pile of wood, all ready to burn, a big bundle and a basket with a lovely bouquet of roses, holly, and evergreen tied to the handle. Oh, mother, did the fairies do it? cried Tilly, pale with her happiness, as she seized the basket while her mother took in the bundle. Yes, dear, the best and dearest fairy in the world called Charity. She walks abroad at Christmas time, does beautiful deeds like this, and does not stay to be thanked answered her mother with full eyes as she undid the parcel. There they were, the warm, thick blankets, the comfortable shawls, the new shoes, and best of all, a pretty winter hat for Bessie. The basket was full of good things to eat, and on the flowers lay a paper saying, For the little girl who loves her neighbor as herself. Mother, I really think my bird is a fairy bird, and all these splendid things come from him, said Tilly, laughing and crying with joy. It really did seem so, for as she spoke, the robin flew to the table, hopped to the bouquet, and perching among the roses, began to chirp with all his little might. The sun streamed in on flowers, bird, and happy child and no one saw a shadow glide away from the window. No one ever knew that Mr. King had seen and heard the little girls the night before, or dreamed that the rich neighbor had learned a lesson from the poor neighbor. And Tilly's bird was a fairy bird, for by her love and tenderness to the helpless thing, she brought good gifts to herself, happiness to the unknown giver of them, and a faithful little friend who did not fly away, but stayed with her till the snow was gone, making summer for her 
in the winter time. And as you drift off to sleep, my friend, you feel secure knowing that in this moment, everything is okay. And every time you listen to my bedtime stories, it just becomes easier and easier for you to get a sound and restful sleep. Each time you listen, you sleep deeply and restfully And when you awake, you feel refreshed and ready for a brand new day ahead, feeling calmer and calmer, more and more at ease. And the calm and more at ease you feel, the better you sleep at night. And the better you sleep at night, the calmer you feel. All you need to do now, my friend, is to just let go and allow yourself to drift deeper and deeper down all the way down into that sound and restful sleep.